Good afternoon, or good evening, actually. Um, uh, just uh, 30 seconds heads up here. We'll roll call presently to get started. All right, um, good evening and welcome to the non-regular City Council meeting for April 14th to hear from our um, boards and authorities, uh, well boards I suppose, advisory boards. Uh, so welcome to everyone who's joining us, so welcome to members of council who've made time for this. I'm just going to do a quick uh, roll call to establish our attendance and then we'll get started in earnest. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. Good evening. Good evening, Councillor Katarina. Councillor Katarina, are you there? He doesn't appear to be in the uh, okay. list of attendance right now. Councillor Zadek? I'm here, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Essinger. Good evening. Evening, Councillor Hamilton. Good evening. Evening, Councillor Henderson. Yep, I'm here. Good evening. Councillor Knack. Good evening. Thank you, Councillor McKean. I'm here. I'm very curious as to where Councillor Knack is beaming in from, the planet of love or something. It's Day of Pink. It's the International Day of Pink. The theme is say, say game over to cyberbullying. How topical. Councillor Nickel? Present. Good evening, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Paquette? He doesn't appear in the list of, of people who have joined the meeting. Noted. Thank you. Councillor Walters? Present. Good day. And Councillor Banga? Councillor Banga advised that he wouldn't uh, be able to attend the meeting uh, this evening. <clears throat> okay. Thank you for that. Well, ten's, uh, ten's enough to get started easily. So uh, thank you. Uh, and. I need a motion now to adopt the agenda with uh, some additions of uh, attachments for some of the work plans, uh, principally for ETSAB. Um, Councillor Esslinger, if you'd be so kind. Yeah, I'm happy to move the April 14th agenda with additions under 6.1 and replacement uh, pages for 6.1. Second. Thank you. Uh, seconded by Councillor Knack. Is there any debate? On the agenda or any questions? Not seeing any, please vote. I'm a yes. We have all the votes except for Councillor McKean's. I'm a yes, sorry. Thank you. Display the vote. Carried 10 nothing. Uh, protocol items. I don't think we had any scheduled for tonight. Um, selection of items for debate. I think we should select all of them since we have delegations on them. Um, and we have no other reports, no requests to speak beyond the delegations, uh, no requests for time specific, so we'll proceed in order. Uh, no bylaws to deal with. There is an opportunity for council inquiries if there are any tonight. Uh, and also I will take notices uh, or no, yes, I can take notices later. So I know some of you had uh, notices we didn't get to yesterday. Uh, there'll be an opportunity to collect those at the end of this meeting. 
and we are here until 9.30 if we need it, but by no means must we go that long. <laughs> However, um, we do this in the evening so that we can uh, respect the availability of our uh, volunteer um, citizen advisory board members, and so we welcome them and appreciate their time. And without further ado, um, maybe I'll just orient a little bit. I think some of you have made presentations to council before. Um, you will not be time limited in your presentations um, and however you want to structure those between your delegations is is up to you. Um, the one thing I would ask uh, is that you mute when you're not speaking uh, just to cut down on feedback uh, and then of course stay on the line once uh, you've presented because I'm sure there'll be follow-up questions from members of council. Um, I would just ask that folks not use the chat function in Google Meet um, because it can create uh, some technical issues for us and also potentially issues of fairness and decorum. It's best for us to work verbally um, through these processes so that everyone can hear and see the same information, ideally. So um, first up is Edmonton Transit Service Advisory Board 2019 and 2020 Annual Reports and 2021 Work Plan. Uh, we have the replacement pages approved and should be uh, in our packages. So um, I don't have with me a uh, list of who is leading the delegation, so I'll ask you to introduce yourselves with apologies. I'd, I'd do that otherwise, but I don't have that in front of me. So welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Evison. Um, good evening, councillors. Uh, thank you for having us tonight. My name is Isabel Hubert Lyle, and I'm the chair of ETSAB, the Edmonton Transit Service Advisory Board. And I'm here tonight to present the board's annual reports for the past two years, um, accompanied by my board colleague, Charlie, uh, our previous chair. ETSAB is a board made up of 12 citizen members, which gives advice and recommendations to council and its committees on matters surrounding public transit. And our board holds general meetings every month and forms subcommittees according to an annual work plan, as well as in an ad hoc manner should this be required. And in order to fulfill its mandate, uh, ETSEP conducts research, seeks input from stakeholders, and writes letters and reports to City Council. And I'll be turning it over to my colleague Charlie now, who will share with you our report from the 2019-2020 term. Thank you, Izzy. Uh, yes, I will deal with the first of the two years uh, that we're reporting. And uh, at the beginning of the 2019-2020 uh, year, we had three new members, uh, William Agboka, Jared Esslinger, and Brian Shepard. They joined us to maintain the complement of the 12 members that Izzy just referred to. What we were doing in that year is basing, uh, is basing it on the work plan, a meeting for which we had on the 16th of February of 2019. And at that time, we selected what we were going to do in terms of studying and forming subcommittees, what items we felt would be of interest uh, to explore over the following 12 months. In addition, addition to that, we had to complete a uh, work on a subcommittee that we had previously started on, and that was uh, work on communications on transit. The other uh, subcommittees we were going to deal with were safety and security, transit for vulnerable populations, ETS marketing, particularly with a view to the introduction of bus network redesign and smart fare. And uh, we have what we call our transit innovation, which is an ongoing a uh, rather informal kind of meeting that we tend, we tend to do every month, sort of half social and more social than business, but we frequently uh, just discussed on an ad hoc basis various topics of transit that came to our attention for one reason or another. So let's start with the uh, communication subcommittee. We were completing work on this and the purpose of the subcommittee was to examine how information is communicated uh, while passengers are on the transit system. This was sort of a follow-up to a subcommittee report that we did the previous year on wayfinding. As we were looking at wayfinding, we also looked at, but didn't go into the details of, the potential for possible communication uh, while passengers are on transit. Particularly for those who are less familiar with the transit system, you may be uh, visitors or may be on a different 
a, a, a route that's unfamiliar? Are there things that ETS are doing, or could there be other things that they could do that would make this a little bit easier for people? Things like trip planning, departure and arrival times, where and when to transfer, looking at the audio, the potential for audio communications, be it on the buses and trains or in the uh, transit stations, we thought they could probably be used to better advantage from time to time. Since that time, of course, they have been, which is great because we hopefully started that ball rolling. Navigation in the system, where to buy fair products, believe it or not, that was uh, something that people were not as familiar with as they would like to be. So uh, there was a shortcoming there, which we tried to address in our report. Use of advertising space. We noticed that uh, there's a lot, a lot of advertising space, not all of it used. Could some of this be used for other forms of communication? Another item that uh, we felt was quite important and we were quite keen on trying to get ETS to introduce this is two-way passenger communication. Per preferably in a more discreet way than it had, than it had been done before. Uh, and since then, uh, relatively recently, uh, fortunately with the uh, ability to use the, the available technology, this has become a reality. Passengers, for example, if they're in a situation where they're uncomfortable or they're witnessing some uh, thing that requires attention, but they don't want to bring attention to themselves, they can very into very discreetly text a message to ETS to a line that is staff 24 hours a day, which is we think is a really great introduction. The results of this report was that we said we submitted a report to the Urban Planning Committee on the 11th of June of 2019. Uh, the, the committee asked administration to have a look at our suggestions and report back uh, a little bit later in the year with uh, any ideas we choose to adopt that we have recommended. They did uh, do that. They reported back on the 3rd of September at the Urban Planning Committee. And I have to say we were very pleased with the initiatives that they accepted and had started working on. And we did write a letter to the Urban Planning Committee uh, in support of the uh, follow-up report from administration. We move on now to the ETS marketing strategy. As I mentioned a little earlier, we were very aware of the importance of really good communication, uh, particularly as it pertains to the very dramatic changes that were about to occur in the transit system, particularly the bus network redesign, also the smart fare. So we looked at it from the user's perspective, which of course is our tendency being a citizen's advisory board. So we looked at it in terms of what do we want to know if, when this system is changing? How am I going to get the information I need to be able, hopefully relatively seamlessly, to uh, continue to use the transit system? We wanted to look also at what types of uh, communication to citizens that DTS in, in particular and the city in general are currently using. How can we reach as many people as possible in a way that is, com is as comprehensible as possible to these people? We we'll took a look to it, how have other people done it? Uh, for example, Halifax, uh, while we were in this process of examining it, Halifax had just gone through a, uh, a network redesign themselves, so we wanted to look at what they did and how they communicated it. We, we wanted to consider timing as well, because this is important if we could, for example, get a, a very comprehensive communication system going and put it out a year in advance, but nobody's going to pay attention to it. We know the reality that people don't really pay attention until it gets closer and closer to the time. So we looked at it in terms of a sort of two to three months lead up time, how you introduce the concept of it's going to happen to more and more detail of what's involved. And then of course, as we get into the last, that last three or four weeks, we come up, we have to get a lot more specific about how people get their information and what it means to them, how they can find it, how they can uh, continue using the system. The result of this uh, subcommittee was that we 
submitted a report to the Urban Planning Committee on the 25th of February of last year. And what we were doing in the course of uh, this subcommittee work, we were liaison, liaisoning fairly regularly with the ETS administration. This is something that the board wanted to do a little bit more of because previously uh, we would submit a report the Urban Planning Committee or whatever committee of council we were dealing with would sometimes then ask administration, go away, look at it, see which of these recommendations uh, is worth pursuing, and come back a few months later. We felt that if we had this commun com ongoing communication while we're doing the work, it would provide administration the ability to respond to it at the time, which is going to be a whole lot more expedient and more efficient for all concerned. And that's what we did. So by the time we submitted this report, uh, it was obvious that uh, what we were suggesting and what ETS were planning were pretty much along the same lines. So we're very pleased to see that that was the case and our report was therefore accepted for information purposes. Our next subcommittee revolved around safety and security. Always a really important topic on any transit system or any area of society for that matter. But uh, what we wanted to do with this is identify, identify the safety and security issues in the ETS system. What the what the, uh, people say, what the statistics say, etc. Try to evaluate measures to overcome these issues. What's been done? What have other people been uh, have found successful? And uh, where where do we go from there? We got a lot of statistics from administration. They were very helpful as we were going through this work. We wanted to know how these statistics were evaluated. We also wanted to find out how new measures were evaluated, any, any measures that were introduced. How successful are they? Are they working the way we thought or are they not? Do they need to be tweaked or do we need something else instead? Again, one of the other things that ETSAP uh, had to introduced over the past couple of years is the recognition that when we're talking about a lot of these issues around transit, we're not the only community-based organization that has input into this. And particularly when it came to safety and security, we thought it important to communicate with WAVE, which we did. Uh, we invited them, whatever would be their preference, either to submit a member uh, uh, to serve on the subcommittee, or alternatively, one of our subcommittee members could go to one of their general meetings where the entire group could have input into the, uh, the, the subject. They chose the latter, and one of our subcommittee members did meet with Wade at one of their general meetings, and uh, we got their point of view about where they see the uh, safety and security issues and the perception of safety and security, all of which is important. As we were going through this, again, we were uh, communicating uh, con continuously with administration and we were pleased to find that we felt that they were going in quite a good direction. Uh, they were very aware, of course, that uh, it's an important issue and one in which they had to do a lot more work. And towards that purpose, uh, their, their plan was to have a multi-stakeholder evaluation uh, in, and that would include ETSA. We were invited to be one of the stakeholders invited to a group that administration would discuss safety and security issues with. This was uh, originally scheduled to take place last to start last September, uh, September 2020. That is, unfortunately, with the pandemic, etc. Uh, at uh, ETS administration, we're a lot more busy in a lot more areas. So that unfortunately had to be postponed. It's still on their agenda. They still insist that it's important to them and they're intending to do it. And uh, it will be initiated shortly, I understand. So we did send a letter to council indicating that stance that we had done a certain amount of work. There's more work to be done, but we were, we would rather than try to establish a report of our own, we would be happy to join the, the uh, multi-stakeholder group and be part of that report. We wanted to look at uh, tra transit use in vulnerable populations. We wanted to identify groups who may, be, who may benefit from the use of transit, but they're not doing so. 
sometimes because of lack of understanding of the system or apprehension about using it. Many of these people would be people who would actually be transit dependent. Many of them would not have alternate forms of transit. So we thought this was an important group to deal with. And again, with our uh, communication with other groups, we invited a uh, member of the Accessibility Advisory Committee uh, to join us if they were interested. And the chair of that committee did serve on our subcommittee as well. And that was very welcome because it's good to have that kind of input as well. The groups we identified uh, initially were seniors, newcomers, students, particularly post-secondary students who are arriving in Edmonton for the first time, many of them, the visually impaired and indigenous groups. The work was delayed because of the COVID situation where a lot of the people uh, who were speaking on behalf of these groups were big. It was a bit difficult to get hold of them with the uh, initiation of the pandemic. So we put it on hold and we did in fact resume and actually complete the report in the 2021 year, which we'll get to a little bit later on. In addition to our subcommittees, we had other uh, communication with council. We spoke to uh, uh, about the uh, proposed fare changes. We also spoke about first and last kilometre. And of course, we had a few submissions around the bus network redesign as well. Then, of course, we had the pandemic, just to give us a little bit more of a challenge, but we don't mind a challenge. A, channel, a challenge is just a situation where you just have to sharpen your focus. So we decided we'd do that and see if we could continue with the work anyway. Uh, the first thing we thought about was, is the work plan that we established still, still valid or are there more important issues that have developed out of the current situation? And we were thinking particularly about COVID and the use of transit. And at the same time, there was much talk and much consternation about uh, the Black Lives Matter situation. So we thought we were very well aware, of course, that uh, the BIPOC community were probably overrepresented in uh, encounters with uh, transit peace officers and uh, fare collectors, etc. So we thought that they may take precedence over what we had originally planned. So what we decided we would do is uh, wait until the new members came on to the, uh, the board and have another meeting about a work plan. So we, because, again, because of the pandemic, the new members were a little bit late in being appointed. But once they were appointed, we had another one of these meetings, a half day meeting where we would discuss the issues that we may choose to pursue over the next 12 months. While we were talking about these, uh, about the timing of this particular meeting, some of the members who had joined the previous year made the comment that they felt that this was a good time to have the meeting uh, after new members were appointed. And the reason they gave for that, and I could understand what they were saying, because I, I guess looking back at it, I felt probably a bit the same way myself. We, they joined the board in May of the previous year. We had our work planning meeting for the following year in February. So when they came along, they joined a work plan that they had no say in. They worked at it, etc. but they felt that after the February meeting, they felt that they were more part of the board. They felt they were more part of the decision making. And we looked at the positive, we took that into consideration, we discussed it, and we looked at the possibility that it may be a better idea in the future to have these work planning committees, uh, work planning meetings, excuse me, after the new members were appointed. And that's what we're doing this year as well. Uh, the members feel much better about it. Uh, to many of us, it's a little more logical way. There is a consequence, though, uh, for you, the council members, in terms of we come to this annual report meeting here in April, and we have not yet had our work planning for the following year. Uh, we hope that council would be okay with this. Uh, we think it's a, a more efficient uh, method of doing the business. I don't know how council feels about 
just allowing us to go, go forward and establish our work plan without them having known, uh, known about it in advance. But if you wish to discuss that, we'll be happy to do that with you. So, of course, like everybody else during the pandemic, we had to get used to online meetings. Fortunately, we have the technology and it went fairly smoothly, which is nice. Another one of the challenges that we were prepared to encounter was the fact that we had a significant turnover of membership at the start of uh, last year. We had a turnover of five members, which on a 12 member board is a significant number. So before the COVID started, we, we recognized this, we discussed this, and everybody was willing, as we would meet, we would sort of all make an effort to get to know the new people and help them out as best we can. This got, became a little bit more difficult since we were no longer meeting in person. We were doing the online meetings. But I have to say, and Isabel will talk about this in a few minutes, but in hindsight, we shouldn't have been so concerned. We had five really good members. They came on board very quickly. They participated quite quickly. A few bumps in the road, but you expect that, but nothing too significant. So that was really very nice, very encouraging. So the members, uh, the member changes, uh, leaving the board were uh, a couple of members, uh, Jorge Arango and Stuart Smith, who because of increased demands of work and family were unable to devote the time to EDSAP, so they did not choose to be reappointed. In the course of the year, Brian Curry took on a uh, course at university that the timing of which conflicted with EDSAP meetings, so he had resigned in the course of the year. The fourth member not seeking reappointment was Bob Macklin. Bob had served six years on the board and was therefore not eligible for reappointment. And the fifth member uh, was an unfortunate loss of Maurice Vincent, who was a victim of a motor vehicle collision in December of 2019. Uh, we went into the uh, new year with uh, the chair and the vice chair unchanged. I was conti out to continue as chair and Isabel as vice chair. So that will completely complete the 2019-2020 portion. And Isabel now will talk about the 2020 to 2021 year. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so 2020, 2021, that's a lot of 20s. Um, as Charlie already uh, alluded to, and as is probably the case for most entities, um, ETSAB's year 2020 was shaped by the COVID-19 pandemic, and we transitioned to purely online meetings early in the year, and we're very happy that we managed to hold all 12 general monthly meetings in the 2021 term remotely. Um, as Charlie said, we experienced a lot of member turnover and we welcomed five new members, uh, Bob Turner, Lindsay Vanstone, Michelle Peters-Jones, Guy Milner and Serena Tang. And as Charlie was saying as well, all of our new members have been contributing with great enthusiasm and commitment right from the start. Um, that has been fantastic. And that's despite the challenges surrounding remote onboarding and collaboration. So that's wonderful. Um, Charlie, uh, Phil Reed, Giselle General, William Agbakoba, Brian Shepard, Jared Esslinger, and myself uh, continued in their member roles. Um, and ETSAB again had 12 members in the 2020 2021 term. Uh, one member, who's actually our previous chair, Charlie, has declined reappointment to the board for the upcoming term. We will miss him greatly, but we are also uh, looking forward to welcoming our new member, of course. Um, so over the course of 2020, ETSAB heard 11 presentations from administration and others on a variety of topics, um, ranging from escalator performance at stations uh, to the Regional Transit Service Commission and the city plan. And as Charlie mentioned, we had initially developed our work plan at a half-day retreat uh, in February. However, we later revised it at a similar meeting uh, in July to recognize the, the very different realities of public transit that were brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have found that holding this annual planning meeting after the new members have joined is, has proven to be very effective since it does give the new members a, a better introduction to the board and they, they feel uh, more involved from the start. So we will continue to... Um, handle our annual quote-unquote retreat um, in this manner uh, going forward if that's possible. And to fulfill our work plan we formed three dedicated subcommittees in the 2020-2021 term um, to conduct research and provide policy positions and recommendations to committees of council. So um, starting here with the returning safely to transit after COVID-19 subcommittee. Um, so 
with the COVID-19 pandemic, reducing public transit ridership to 50% or at times less uh, of the 2019 numbers, and with many passengers also having concerns about contracting the virus on transit. Um, the subcommittee completed research into best practices regarding uh, cleaning, sanitization, and also communication around public transit during the pandemic. Um, and the subcommittee found that public transit was not a significant vector of disease transmission and uh, delivered a report which outlined several recommendations regard regarding ridership recovery. And this report was presented to the Urban Planning Committee um, on March 23rd of this year, uh, accompanied by a verbal response from ETS administration, which uh, recognized that most of our recommendations were already being met or in the process of being met. Then moving on to the uh, inclusive transit BIPOC experiences with Edmonton Transit Service uh, Subcommittee. Like Charlie already mentioned, um, in, in light of the events of the Black Lives Matter protests and the also, as well the recent racist attacks at Edmonton Transit Stations uh, against Muslim women, um, this subcommittee set out to highlight the lived experiences of Black, Indigenous and people of color on ETS. Um, the subcommittee completed a jurisdictional scan of best practices and other transit systems uh, and supported, uh, sorry, submitted a report uh, with recommendations around communications and uh, an emphasis away from enforcement in favor of safety and security uh, by security staff and peace officers. And this report is scheduled to be presented to the Community and Public Services Committee uh, on May 25th of this year. And then moving on to the uh, Transit and Vulnerable Populations Subcommittee. Um, this subcommittee had been put on hold during the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic and then was later uh, rebooted. And this subcommittee completed a jurisdictional scan for programs which can help vulnerable users navigate public transit systems. So, for example, via coaching uh, on an actual transit bus. So the subcommittee reached out to a number of groups in the city um, with the result that several senior centers and new newcomer groups uh, showed an interest, uh, plus an indigenous group as well, who are already actually running a similar program um, aimed particularly at members of their community who are new to the city. Um, so in, in this report, the subcommittee recommended that ETS set up uh, an education program for seniors and newcomers in which volunteers would coach individuals on all aspects of the transit system. And uh, this report will be presented um, on May 25th as well, so same day as the, uh, the BIPOC report as well. Um, in addition to producing three reports, ETSAB also sent three delegates to the virtual CUDA conference in November 2020. Um, we also spoke to City Council on the subject of budget adjustments in December 2020 and sent a letter regarding the uh, motion to delay the bus network redesign uh, this month. And uh, next month, we're planning to develop our 2021-2022 work plan uh, at a virtual planning meet in May, once our new member has joined us. Um, we also held elections in January at the first regular board meeting of 2021, um, where the board elected uh, myself as chair and Lindsay Vanstone as vice chair for the upcoming term. Um, we're both very excited to be in these new roles. There's no shortage of topics that are of great importance to public transit, uh, of course, and we are looking forward to working on reports and recommendations to council together with our board members. Uh, yeah, we'd like to thank all of our members for generously donating their time to ETSAB and at meetings and subcommittees. And also we'd like to thank uh, Councillor Nack as our council liaison. Um, your presence at our meetings is invaluable and we, we thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Isabel, uh, and thank you to uh, Charles, and thanks through you both to uh, all of your advisory board colleagues. I, I think um, not only is there a lot to cover because it's been two years, but they've been two fairly extraordinary years apart from the pandemic and then with the pandemic. So your advice uh, through all of these transitions and challenges has been really valuable to us uh, all the way along, but especially uh, of late in these two years. So let me just say thank you on behalf of uh, all of us here on City Council for your efforts. And Charles, thank you for your leadership as, as chair. I'm sorry we're losing you from the committee, uh, but uh, I, I, I can safely assume your stalwart continuing support of public transit here in our city, uh, perhaps through a different forum. So thank you, Charles. Thank you. And yes, I will always support public transit in any way I can. <laughs> Me too. So, uh, questions for our ETSAB representatives. Have we got anyone clicked into the board? 
No one yet, Mr. Mayor. Not seeing any questions so far. I mean, looking forward to a robust uh, uh, conversation with your next report in May. I see Councillor Knack is on the board now, so I'll quit stalling. Go ahead. No, that's fine, Mr. Mayor. I don't, I mean, because I see them all the time and we have lots of conversations. I figure I, I don't actually have questions. Uh, I figured if no one did, I could, I could move the recommendation and briefly speak once the time is appropriate. Um, sure. Yeah, go ahead and move it. And then I'll just make one last call for questions for ETSAB on the verbal report or the attachments. Okay, not seeing any. Go ahead, Councillor Knack. Uh, yes, Mr. Aaron, and you already started to sum it up. I just, uh, in particular, wanted to give one one more shout out to Charlie uh, for for his leadership uh, during this time, as as he's going to be stepping away. Uh, it is greatly appreciated. It was it was. I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Charlie, but I was pretty sure when the time came to uh, determine who was going to be chair, you weren't necessarily like jumping at it. I think if I remember that meeting. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but that would be true. <laughs> in fact, in uh, fact I, I inherited it when my predecessor had to resign. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm always, all the boards and committees I've served on, I always see myself as a, a stronger number two person than a number one. But yes, you're correct. It was, I agreed to do it, but I was hoping somebody else would have stepped up instead. <laughs> Well, well, I, and I raised that because, you know, you you came on uh, maybe a little reluctantly at the beginning and then had to go through one of the most challenging times ever and yet still provide incredible advice and make sure that the, 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 the whole board was able to work through this and still put together recommendations and still come forward. So, um, yeah, your, your, uh, your support and, and your incredible dedication to this is, is just so appreciated. And, and thank you for the ongoing work, the the uh, advice that we get out of these is, as I find, incredibly valuable, and uh, and I think this is one. This is we're just real fortunate to have you, and then everyone else who's still staying on. Um, and and I didn't have any questions because again, I've watched the work and been there for as much as I can of of most of the meetings, and uh, and so I'm looking forward to some of the ongoing work. I'm really excited about as we go forward again, and we heard it briefly talked about how. Um, reports may come forward almost a bit like audit committee now with, with uh, the recommendations uh, from the board and then the admin response at the same time, which I actually think is a really smart approach for something like this because uh, then we're not sending them back for a few months and coming back. So I think that's going to make that even more effective uh, than they have been in the past. So just real excited to see the, the ongoing work of this group. So that's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Please vote on receipt of information. Uh, may I have a second, or, oh, uh, I'll Mr. Second Mayor? It. Thank you. All right, it's council. Getting rusty. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have all the votes except for Councillor Paquette's. Yeah, my uh, token has expired. Who was uh, sent me a note to let me know he uh, joined us shortly after roll call, so he's been here for uh, the whole discussion, just for, for the notes. Um, display the vote then, please. Carried unanimously. Um... Next up is the Accessibility Advisory Committee, and I've got uh, Jason Pizeski and Tonya LaRiviere. Are you both with us? Yes. That's correct. Yep. Welcome. Who's leading off the presentation? Uh, I will go first. And first of all, you nailed both of the names. Great job. I'm not sure if you rehearsed first. Um, <laughs> yes, good evening, uh, Mayor Iveson and City Council. My name is Jason Pizeski, the current chair of the Accessibility Advisory Committee, my second term as such, and my fifth year on the committee as a whole, meaning I am entering into my final year here as the calendar turns into May. Uh, our committee is made up of 15 volunteers who bring a lot of depth uh, and rich perspectives uh, regarding people with disabilities. Uh, the AAC has three subcommittees. We have a policy review subcommittee, 
a community engagement subcommittee, uh, and the newest addition, the intake subcommittee. The policy review subcommittee focuses on uh, drafting reports and letters to city council and appearing before city council to present on more uh, technical uh, and research-based matters. The community engagement subcommittee focuses on engaging with stakeholders uh, in the public and within uh, the city corporation. Together, I kind of refer to these as community engagement is the, um, the eyes and the ears of the AAC, while the policy review is the mouthpiece of the AAC. We also have a new addition starting in 2019. We piloted what we refer to as the intake subcommittee. The AAC uh, historically has uh, operates, I don't know, differently than, than other subcommittees, um, than some of them, I think for sure, in that there's definitely an ad hoc nature to the work the AAC does. There's a lot of uh, very uh, quick issues that come before us uh, and a lot of distinct and small issues, uh, maybe not all of them warranting an entire report uh, to, to city council yourselves. Oftentimes it's uh, conversations with uh, members of the corporation. Uh, and we were finding that a lot of requests were coming in at the exact level, the executive level, which makes sense why they would come there, but they were also being dealt with at executive meetings. And we were finding that there wasn't a uh, perhaps diverse enough mix of, of views and opinions um, and experiences on the executive. It's of course only made up of three members. Uh, and of course there are uh, many more than three uh, disabilities. So in order to increase the, um, the quality of the advice we were giving to people, we wanted to create a new subcommittee, the intake subcommittee, which has a rotating cast of, of AAC uh, members on it. And at the same time, it's also, the meetings are more uh, scheduled, of course, into the calendar. Uh, people know about them, people know what issues are on them. So if there's an issue that you uh, that a member feels they uh, can make a contribution towards, they, they can join on top of the, the kind of mandatory uh, members who we assign to the rotating cast. Uh, and that has been a very successful experiment, that new subcommittee. Uh, members enjoy it. It's, it's their favorite subcommittee to sit on because um, they get to talk about diverse issues and it's a lot more direct meetings with people with specific questions um, and then if a group is ready to uh, meet with a more specialized group or a bigger group, then that group can, of course, refer them on. Um, but it's been a great uh, way to get everyone more involved in a lot more issues uh, and get a higher quality of advice uh, to people. So we have the chair of the policy subcommittee uh, here with me. That would be my colleague, Tanya. She has been the uh, chair in that position for two years, and she will be taking over as chair uh, again when the calendar turns over to May. Very excited about that. She's going to be phenomenal. Community engagement has been a little more in flux for the last two years. Uh, we did have a chair in 2019. That was Christopher Minchow. He has spoken before you before. He had been in that position for, for at least one year. Uh, and I know he's he had spoken to uh, you folks at this these meetings before. Uh, he stepped down in 2020. And by the nature of 2020, uh, community engagement became very difficult. Uh, and we actually went through the year without an official chair, uh, as many of our, our channels for community engagement were, were shut down. Um, it became more of a more of an ad hoc uh, measure simply by the, the time. Uh, and unfortunately, Chris is not on the AAC uh, this anymore. So I'll, I will uh, step in and uh, wear the hat of community engagement chair. So uh, on May 13th, obviously the AAC was informed, uh, sorry, May 13th, 2020, was informed that uh, city of Edmonton was temporarily suspending administrative support to committees of council due to COVID-19. The AAC made the decision to continue 
to meet without administrative support. Uh, they were they rejoined us in November, but the AAC held, uh, I believe, all of its meetings throughout that. Uh, we may have taken a uh, slight recess in summer due to uh, simple lack of qual uh, quantity of work. But by and large, the AAC operated uh, uninterrupted through the pandemic. A large part of that was uh, our fantastic city council liaison, uh, Councillor Knack who did his best to step into that admin role it, as and when, if we needed to be connected with someone, if we had questions about what was going on, uh, he was a fantastic uh, soundboard for us. Uh, and he uh, really kept us connected and connected, kept us working and kept highlighting uh, the issues that were coming up that uh, were coming before yourselves uh, as city council. So we provide, um, advice to city council, obviously on city owned infrastructure uh, and city run programs, services, activities, and policies for the purpose of improving the city's livability, inclusiveness, and accessibility for individuals with disability. By the same token bylaw 17002 states that we may also identify and engage stakeholder groups and seek their input in the committee work. Uh, our committee has been busy in the last two years we are very proud of the work we were able to accomplish in 2019, 2020. Uh, one highlight that stands out for me uh, for 2019 in particular is the AAC's presentations to city council. This was something that Councillor Knack uh, stressed almost immediately upon joining what was that, uh, you know, city council wanted to hear more from us uh, and felt that we had a lot to contribute. And so in 2019, we appeared three times before city council on the snow and ice report that summer. Uh, that would be the very fun one where we all learned about the chemistry of uh, road chemicals. Uh, but of course we were there uh, on, on more accessible issues, but that was the uh, brunt of the other conversations. Um, we presented our report on accessible taxis uh, we are continuing to work on accessible taxis. That is basically my legacy item. I started working on that in 2016 when joining the AAC, and we are still doing good work on that item. Of course, now we're opening in DATS, talking about uh, ride sharing, things that didn't even exist when that conversation started. Uh, and we also spoke to City Council on policy C602 in fall of 2019. Of course, the city accessibility for people with disabilities policy. We were very encouraged by the positive feedback we received and we hope that the AAC will be in front of council more in the future. Opportunities were a little more limited in 2020, but we did appear before city council uh, on the city plan item, highlighting uh, some deficiencies we felt uh, or oversights in the, in the city plan at the time, in particular dealing with uh, housing uh, and employment for disabled Edmontonians. Uh, a few highlights from 2020, other than city plan, we were um, we worked with city administration on the mass exemptions uh, and we continued work with snow and ice. So I will now put on my hat as the chair of the community engagement subcommittee. As the name implies, our role is to actively engage with our community at large to do a few things. We listen and learn from fellow citizens with disabilities on the issues they are facing in the community. We assess the situation at hand and if possible, how the subcommittee can potentially provide support with any issues. We consult with our stakeholders, which could include not only residents, but also nonprofit organizations and either even other municipal governments. And in collaboration with the policy subcommittee, we move forward uh, in presenting and advising city council on issues. Although it's 2021, we still face challenges with people not having accessibility at the forefront of their mind. Another item that we have been trying to move the needle on is raising our profile within the community. A few highlights of the past two years are in Sorry, we hosted the National Accessibility Week in spring, summer of 2020. Uh, 
the National Accessibility Week is kind of the new banner uh, disabled awareness and celebration week on the national calendar. Um, there was a few other days throughout the year. Uh, and they've kind of been uh, lumped into National Accessibility Week and we have jumped on that bandwagon with Fervor. In years we've hosted uh, accessible housing tours, film festivals, and in 2020, we hosted a fringe alumni who put on a fantastic show uh, about living with ADHD. Uh, we hosted a presentation from two Amazing Race contestants, Amazing Race Canada contestants, uh, one of them who is legally blind. Uh, they were uh, very funny uh, and great speakers. And we also hosted more accessible home tours. Uh, those are very popular uh, items and they get people uh, talking and thinking. Uh, and we are very grateful for the Edmontonians who open up their homes to us uh, and let uh, basically just host an open house and let the public walk through uh, and point and ask questions. And we've had fantastic volunteers in the community who've, who've shown uh, that accessible housing is possible, that it's not that hard and it doesn't have to be expensive. Uh, and so those are, those are great uh, events. We hope to host them in the future. Um, by the same token, we have strengthened our social media presence by diversifying our social media team. We've successfully coordinated and provided input into the, uh, the mayor's awards. And we helped move that forward um, with the option of moving it into the protocol office, uh, which I believe is going to be called just the Edmonton Awards or the Awards of Excellence, with the idea, of course, that we want those awards to be with all the other awards um, and celebrate at the same time as, as all the other uh, excellent things going on in this city. We reviewed an accessibility events guide and provided feedback, and we continue to engage and consult with various city of Edmonton departments on accessibility, accessibility related projects, uh, COVID-19 response, policies, policy C602, Edmonton city plan, how that's gonna be implemented, waste services, snow and ice, bus network redesign, first kilometer, last kilometer, touch the water promenade, and the Emily Murphy Park renewal project to name some of the things we have been involved in. We plan to keep this momentum going and are very excited to start working on a communication strategy in 2021, kind of rebooting the community engagement. We have a brand new chair, we voted in, Sherry Clausen. We are very excited uh, about uh, having her energy and ideas. Uh, we have, in the last 12 months, we've added, uh, we had five new members join the AAC at large, uh, beginning at the beginning of the pandemic. Not a great time to be onboarding people. Uh, but they did phenomenally, the five members who joined. Uh, and we have just added three more members. So on a policy of 50, uh, on a committee of 15, we've added eight new members uh, or more than half of them uh, in the last two years. So a lot of new ideas, new energy joining the AAC. Uh, and we've directed a lot of that energy as best we could to community engagement uh, to, to kind of reboot and reimagine what it is, especially uh, as as it appears, COVID will uh, remain with us for the, for the uh, at least the the medium term. So uh, this year we so last year, unfortunately, all of our events for NAW were in person events. They take lots of planning uh, and time, and so those were all those were all canceled. Uh, NAW is, is a May June uh, festival, so there was no NAW last year, unfortunately. Uh, this year we are like we did have one or two uh, digital items, I should say, before our social media kind of went dark without admin support. Uh, this year we are planning to do an action calendar, uh, giving Edmontonians uh, lots of tips and ideas uh, and events uh, they can attend, most of them virtual. We're looking at featuring previous Mayor's Awards winners. Of course, we every year we produce, uh, every year we did the Mayor's Awards, we did amazing vignettes. Uh, with the assistance of uh, Global News. And so we plan on uh, featuring those on social media called a Throwback Thursday, a Flashback Friday, something like that to uh, kind of reuse that content and uh, bring awareness to, again, the great things that have gone on in this city and hopefully inspire uh, more business owners as we transition into um, 
sorry, business owners and, and organizations as we transition into a post-COVID world. Uh, and we're also going to cross-promote with other organizations that are that are doing things. For example, there's a film festival that's going to be going on in the city uh, dealing with accessibility. So I will leave that for now for community engagement for the last two years. Again, a bit of a roller coaster when talking about uh, engaging with people as uh, it's changed radically in the last 24 months. Um, but I will now pass it over to my colleague, Tonya LaRiviere, the policy review uh, subcommittee chair for the last two years. Good evening. <clears throat> as Jason said, my name is Tonya LaRiviere, and I'm the current chair of the policy review subcommittee. Paige Reeves will be the next policy chair starting in May. Before proceeding, I wanted to acknowledge and thank Jason for the leadership he has provided to this committee and the role of chair. He has set an example I hope to follow. As he mentioned, we piloted the intake committee in 2018, and the response to that was positive, and we officially incorporated it as a permanent addition to our operational structure in 2019. In June of 2019, Jason and I spoke to the Community and Public Services Committee about the Snow and Ice pilot report and brought our own concerns forward regarding the inclusion of accessibility to policy C409J, Snow and Ice Control. In short, we felt the current policy needed to include and address safety issues and seasonal challenges and barriers for individuals with disabilities. We were grateful that all of our concerns were being recognized we will continue to engage on our recommendations. The passing of policy C602, accessibility for people with disabilities, was exciting for this committee. We'd like to publicly and formally thank City Council for recognizing the importance of this policy, and we look forward to consulting with city departments in regards to the implementation of the corporate access accessibility plan. Transportation was a significant topic for us over the last two years. We contributed to the DATS report presented in June, advised on the ETS bus redesign, the drop-off zone pilot, first kilometer, last kilometer, e-park. We kept an eye on safety concerns with e-scooters and consulted with Vehicle for Hire and the MN Transit Service Advisory Board. We also presented a report to Community and Public Service Committee regarding our concerns with the lack of accessible taxis. Afterwards, we met with representatives from the Greater Edmonton Taxi Alliance and United Taxi Group for a more in-depth discussion. We recognize that this is a complicated issue with diverse interests at play. We will continue to advise with taxi companies, vehicle for hire, city council, and other stakeholders in hopes of finding a solution that benefits everyone. We also consulted on open option parking, the zoning bylaw, and how it will impact barrier-free parking stalls. Jason and I attended the city plan public hearing to express our concerns regarding the lack of inclusion of accessibility items in its current draft. Our main concerns were regarding accessible housing, transit, specifically a paratransit network and employment. CBC Radio Active reached out the next day for an interview. We've also met with Marie Renaud, MLA St. Albert. Marie has been doing ongoing outreach with and outreach with Albertans with disabilities. Recent concerns included age payments and benefits and private sector care for individuals with developmental disabilities. We will continue to share information and address issues concerning Edmontonians with disabilities. In 2020, we continue to work as a committee without the support of admin because we recognize the importance of continuing our work at this time when adaptations needed to be made. As a city, we experienced how quickly we can adapt and make changes when it is a priority. It turns out we can work from home. Collectively, we are experiencing isolation and the inability to access services and locations. One day, most people will get to experience life as they did before. Many individuals with disabilities don't get that reprieve. We're hoping this can be a time to reflect and rethink accessibility for a more, from a more personal and tangible perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, both of you, and also for persevering. I think um, having to continue to meet um, virtually has been a challenge for for this council, um, and I think then certainly for our advisory boards too. But 
you're working from such an exceptional platform of, of leadership uh, and a culture that's well established. I'm, I'm sure that that uh, helped you persevere through this difficult year and continue to provide really important input to us on, on things like snow and ice, certainly, and the other work that uh, we rely on the committee for. So let me say thank you to you both and, and also through you to your colleagues on the committee for for your efforts. Um, I see Councillor Henderson has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, just knowing how much this has been an ongoing conversation over the years, I'm really curious how your conversation with the taxi folk went and if there's anything you can share from that that might be useful to the ongoing conversation. It's progressing. Um, I, <laughs> the problem is that I think we're running into, and maybe it's... Uh, my undergraduate degree is economics, so I have great empathy where um, a lot of it is the incentives for the actual individuals, um, uh, you know, the drivers. And uh, I have a certain amount of uh, understanding, at least, for, um, you know, driving all the way across the city to pick up one ride that might only be five minutes if I can figure out if I've been waiting in line at the airport for two hours. Uh, and I'm the only accessible taxi on the road. So, um, unfortunately, we haven't. They, there's no way past that that hurdle. They they keep bringing forward. We've um, proposed certain uh, alternatives. Uh, of course, we've said, well, we would. Uh, we've of course talked about giving um, uh, per diems to to riders, and of course, the industry wants those uh, to go to the to the drivers. So. There is a bit of a loggerhead there on just the incentives of the driver that uh, short of finding some way to uh, to force people to pick uh, people up. Um, we, there are there is talks about a um, about dealing with the dispatching, though, because uh, every uh, taxi company has its own uh, dispatch. Um, it can be hit or miss if you're picking the one that has the most taxis on the road. Uh, so some cities have gotten over that by uh, combining uh, their dispatching. So there have been conversations about um, perhaps linking up with the with the DAT system, uh, figuring out a way to do that, or at least figuring out some way of sharing dispatching. So um, you're not just calling all the taxi companies and hoping you you get one that has cars on the road. Uh, so that's that's being reviewed. Um, I mean, in a perfect world, I would also like to see, and, and I know there is a you know, your, your ride sharing companies, uh, your Ubers, I don't, there's no lift here yet, but I know they pay a, a surcharge for, for not having accessible vehicles on the road, but I know in other cities they do have accessible vehicles. So, um, that could also be a means in the future for, uh, potentially, uh, bettering the situation of, of accessible, uh, transportation options for Edmontonians. But, no, we seem to, um, there does seem to be a loggerhead of uh, how do we get past the, you know, when someone can kind of just uh, not pick up their radio or uh, go to the washroom when the call comes in. That's a uh, difficult issue to get past, just human incentive and human nature. <laughs> no, great. Well, well, thanks, and, and thanks for staying well, on that one. I mean, I, th I think because it, it comes up, you know, every time that we have the same conversation with the taxi folk and it, it'd be nice to bash through to some kind of solution. And I suspect we have some tools. Um, I mean, obviously with the circumstances right now, you know, it's not the time, I mean, because taxis are struggling for all sorts of other reasons, but I, I would hate to lose this one because it clearly is not something we've solved yet. Um, despite the fact that, you know, we created an awful lot of licenses that we were not originally going to create in the hopes that it would solve it. And it feels to me like all we've done is create licenses and haven't helped the problem. So it'd be, you know, I, 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 any ideas I think would be welcome as you move forward and think about it and work on it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Essinger. Thank you. And, and thank you very much for the work that you do. Um, as well as uh, the commitment of your time. And we truly appreciate it. Uh, I was just wondering if you've worked with WAVE at all and if you've identified any issues of safety concerns, because um, I know they had worked on some work with um, 
the accessible taxis as well. I had some concerns, so I wasn't sure if that was on your radar or not. It is. Uh, we had plans to connect better with them uh, before COVID, but I, I believe they um, uh, they had issues during COVID. But I'm not sure. Uh, we just we weren't able to connect through 2020. Uh, but we do know we are aware that that's an issue on their radar, um, and perhaps if, if some aren't aware, uh, we are. There is a push amongst the uh, certain boards, at least, to uh, increase our collaboration and uh, intersectionality of issues. So I think we're going to be working more with with lots of of the subcommittees. There's going to be that push. It's something um, I've really uh, tried to to foster as chair. I've uh, throughout uh, 2020, I sat down with the chair of uh, the anti racism advisory committee, uh, the newly created uh, committee. I've also made a habit of sitting on the uh, in on ETSAB uh, meetings. So I'm really excited that there's going to be a push for, for greater collaboration because I know uh, lots of these uh, transit related issues are things uh, WAVE is particularly interested in. So as they gear back up, we're excited to, to connect. Thank you. And I look forward to that collaboration. Thank you. Councillor Banga. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, again, um, thanks for your uh, participation in this uh, city building process. And uh, I know I have been uh, uh, having some talks with uh, uh, taxi companies and drivers, operators. Uh, did they suggest any solution to this current problem that we are having? Having enough, uh, I guess, accessible taxis on the on the road. I don't think they had a concrete uh, thing to try. I think they liked the idea of the dispatch, uh, combining that and, and figuring out a way to make sure um, that at least everyone's on the same page. Um, again, they're really interested in some kind of uh, rebate or per diem for for drivers. Uh, you know, if uh, perhaps. If you have to drive, you know, if, if a taxi driver, we could do a study and figure out, hey, on average, you have to drive 10 kilometers to, to pick up a fare. Uh, if you have to drive double that, then maybe there's some kind of, uh, you know, you can start the, the fare early and then that bill goes to the city or the province or something. I'm not sure exactly what they're imagining for a rebate. That uh, is kind of what I'm, I'm, I'm imagining they're imagining. Um, I'm not sure that's workable, how you do that, how those get uh, submitted to the city, how those how those issues kind of get worked out. Um, I think right now we're focused on perhaps getting more information from from the dispatches to see, you know, to try and locate where the issues are really arising. Is it specific locations? Is it specific days? Um, to really hone in uh, and then see if things like uh, the dispatch can help can help fill that void. Okay. So in your talks with, uh, I guess, all the stakeholders, uh, did the topic of uh, distance-based fares ever came into place? I can't recall specifically if distance-based ones came up. I think that's one that I've thrown out as at least what the, again, my just economics background, just like the idea of what the problem is, is the fact that you have to drive further uh, to get these rides because there might, you know, you might just be in the wrong quadrant. Um, I, I just, I know they're, they're in favor of some kind of uh, rebate or, or per diem, whatever you, whatever you call it, uh, that they could, they could charge for these. Per diem is not the right word. That's a, it's a per day thing. Uh, some kind of rebate uh, that they could, they could, they could get from the city for picking up these extra rides, whether that's fixed or variable. I'm not, uh, uh, okay. I wouldn't want to put words in their mouth and say what they're proposing. I just, I know that's, it's of that nature of, and to a certain extent, yeah, if we're trying to, if the problem is human incentive, then of course we need to fix the humans with that incentive. Uh, but, but how we get there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so in your work, uh, did you had a look at any other jurisdictions, how they handled uh, this issue? 
and if they're doing a better job than somehow us? I, th I think some some are, um, and it, but it might just be a volume on the road and uh, volume of of uh, of riders as well. Uh, I know our DAT system is very uh, well overloaded, so we might have more people uh, going going to DATS. I think DATS would tell you they have uh, statistically high ridership compared to other cities, um, whereas other cities may just have a culture of more accessible taxis, more on the road, a bigger population, and, and more, again, your odds of being in the correct quadrant might be better, whereas in Edmonton, maybe if it's two in the morning and you have one person needing a ride uh, and one accessible taxi, uh, at the dispatch you call, that might be the maybe the problem. But some cities do do handle it better, and we're trying to coordinate um, with them to find out, you know, the ways in which they handle the problem. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, and again, thank you to both of you and and the entire committee for uh, the the excellent work. And as you noted, it was particularly challenging without. Um, Having having that additional support uh, for a good number of months, so thank you for persevering through that and finding a way to uh, to stay engaged and to stay working on on everything you should be doing. I just wanted to ask briefly about uh, housing because you know why not <laughs> uh, <laughs> and accessible housing. And I know I know there has been some work. I know there have been some conversations. I just want to get your take as to. How you feel accessible housing, you know where where we're at, and and is there something we can do? Because I'm still feeling like we're we're not where we need to be, and we know there's been that disconnect between the people who are providing it and and maybe those that need it. So anything else you wanted to just sort of share in terms of what what we could be working on, how we could help if possible? For sure. Uh, and you have uh, been listening to me talk for a long time. Tanya, do you want to uh, touch on accessible housing? Give them a break sure. from me. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, I think I think I can speak on the issue seems to start with the developers. If there is a way in which the city can implement any bylaws, say, or incentives for accessible housing, I don't know what the answer is, but when we talk to the developers, they say, well, there is no uptake, but you also have to look at where are the locations of you know, this housing that they say is accessible, is is it in a where you have to try it? Is it is it a walkable or are amenities close by? Uh, so, I mean, in some ways it's complicated and in some ways I feel like it's, it's not. It's, you know, literally a matter of building a visitable at the very least home but it seems like the onus is on the developers yeah and and i i had a um, phone call with a person who is who lives in spruce grove planning on moving into the city and the experience she had to go through to try and be able to build a new house they're looking to build in a new area in the city of edmonton and they find themselves that every builder immediately put a premium up on it even though when you're building from scratch, as we've seen in many other developments, that that isn't the case, that the cost isn't actually any higher, but but it was sort of just added on. So I don't know if there's, I, and I don't know what the right solution is. I know we've been talking about, I know in past iterations of AAC, there had been some, a, a little more connectivity, some, some particular folks. And so maybe we can think about that at a future meeting as to how we best try to bring this one together, recognizing yes, housing still primarily provincial responsibility, but the accessible piece is something that really fits within this broader plan. So, okay. I just wanted to ask about that one because it's just one that I feel like I'm still wish we could do more on. So I Thank think you. it's actually like almost like a civil rights issue that we do make housing accessible for everybody. Mm -hmm. 
and Thank um you. yeah you highlighted the uh tanya the the disconnect of yeah developers say that no one buys it uh, and then we have purchasers who say no one makes it um of course developers will say they're the last units to sell in their building um so we and some cities have a registry set up to try and uh, connect people to fill those gaps we've we've looked into that um on the policy side, one thing we ran into for uh, the city plan uh, and our points of advice to, to city council and city admin was there was a real focus on uh, affordable housing. And we said, well, why can't it be affordable and accessible housing? Just just add an and there. And and, um, and I, I don't think that change was adopted this go around. We were told the city plan is a living document and, uh, you know, as it's revised, perhaps it'll be accessible and affordable housing um but um, it's a good point yeah part so of our, our push is to get it recognized policy wise as, as a big push from from the city council level as, as well so yeah no good good point thank you yeah i appreciate that and if there's no one else listening i can also move uh, receipt of information for this as well thank you Councillor knack any further questions not seeing Second. any thank you Councillor mckean um, please vote on receipt of information. I mean, yes, uh, Madam Clerk, Mr. Clerk. There we go. Oop, oop. <laughs> I am also a yes. There it comes again. Yes. It just popped up again. Try it. And we have all the votes. Display the vote. Carried. Um, so another member of council has joined us then. Uh, Councillor Banga, obviously, he asked questions. So that's 11, or sorry, 12 now. Um, okay, next up, thank you to uh, Tonya and Jason again for being here with us. Um, Next up is the uh, Women's Advocacy Voice of Edmonton Committee, and Hersharon Sandhu is presenting, I, I believe. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, everyone. Good evening. I hope you're all doing well. My name is Hersharon Sandhu. This is, I think, my third or fourth time presenting to council, but I'm pleased to be representing Women's Advocacy Voice of Edmonton as a newly elected chair during this reporting period. Our vice chair, Angelica Matson, is presently attending a social media training session with our with the rest of the members and gives her regrets and cannot be here at this time. For my verbal report, I'd like to highlight some of the accomplishments that are already detailed in the report. Since our last time we talked, uh, we was collaborated on the development of new leadership resources to encourage women to get involved in running for public office. This includes working with Equal Voice Impact Bot, the Yet Parity Bot, and supporting partnerships with the Act Parity and other community organizations. We participated in training to support their understanding and enable a response to the recommendations outlined in Reclaiming Power in Place, the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. We also provided input on nine city plans, initiatives, and reports to City Council, including Bus Redesign slash Transit Strategy, Disabled Adult Transit System, or DATS, City Plan, Early Learning and Care Spaces, LRT Station Security Update and Progress Report, Vehicle for Hire, First Kilometer, Last Kilometer's Community Solutions, Diversity and Inclusion Framework, and Edmonton Safe Cities Tool. Despite the brief pause uh, due to the pandemic and other restrictions, WAVE started its work back in November of 2020. We have recontinued our good work with three working groups this time around, Policy, Reconciliation and Allyship, and leadership and engagement. As we explore new ways to expand our audience reach, since we cannot host in-person meetings and events with current social distancing policies, with a brand new diverse wave committee with um, seven new members, so quite a significant turnover, we are ready to forge ahead to continue our work as we have done so in the past. Our reconciliation and allyship group has helped us integrate the practice of assigning wave members to start our meetings off with a lad acknowledgement to help us properly contextualize our critical work. Our leadership and engagement group is working hard to put us back on track with social media 
our Twitter and Facebook accounts, which have more than 17,000 following altogether, have been reinstated. We also started a new Instagram account to widen our outreach to more audiences. Our policy group has undertaken a review of the current vehicle for hire policy and are highlighting ways that we can continue to help council better serve our population. After years of reviewing city council, city policy programs, and initiatives with a gender lens, we are happy to report that the majority of our work comes from various city departments reaching out to us. This supports the council's desire to have a GBA plus lens incorporated into city work, which is instrumentally important as we look forward towards pandemic recovery plans. Looking forward as well, we was focused on providing resources to our community in regards to the incoming municipal election, broadening our reach digitally and virtually, and increasing collaboration between our fellow committees and advisory boards. So to the previous question that Council Esslinger asked of the Accessibility Council, WAVE is planning to get in touch with that committee to integrate our advocacies together, um, as well with other committees that are presenting today. I also want to take this opportunity to deeply thank councillors who supported the critical advocacy work of No Women Without and committed to providing free menstrual products in all women and gender inclusive washrooms located in city-owned facilities. As you all know, this is a huge step towards ending period poverty, and I just want to take this moment to thank you. Um, I'm happy to take on any questions at this time. Well, thank you, Ms. Sandhu. Um, appreciate um, uh, that acknowledgement at the end. Uh, but uh, m more importantly, uh, all of your work and your colleagues' work. Um, we'll try not to keep you too long so you can join them <laughs> for the workshop. I'm, I'm grateful that they're uh, getting training. Um, that's that's also good to hear. So um, we want these to be fulfilling uh, and and uplifting opportunities for people we empower as our advisors. And so I'm, I'm going to in, infer that that's what's happening for your colleagues. So without further ado, I've got uh, questions up now from uh, Councillor Banga. Thank you, Miss Andu. Uh, thanks for your uh, I guess valuable work there. Uh, I just wanted to ask you. Uh, about um, the involvement of uh, the different groups in the community. Uh, I'm taking an example of uh, Indo-Canadian Women's Association. Are you somehow uh, contacting those folks? Because that might be a good source for you to gather some more information. Yeah, so we've worked with many different groups in the past. Uh, Indo Canadian Women's Association, we've had a pretty good uh, contact with in the past. Uh, the pandemic did put a big damper on us for about six months. Wave Committee wasn't able to uh, get the work together. And with seven new members, we have new groups that they're representing and new networks that they're bringing in. We're currently in the process of examining all those new networks and how we can best use them. Um, but we have been in touch with the Indo Canadian Women's Association. Many of our past members have actually volunteered with the Indo Canadian Women's Association and that's how we came to know their work. Okay, thank you. That's great. Councillor Atzinger. Well, I, I'm very familiar with the work of WAVE and I and can move the report when it's appropriate. But I guess I have one question for you um, and one comment. Um, one of the things that uh, that Councillor Banga referenced was the idea that you have different networks throughout the city. And some of that work can be done in person and you're moving to more digital landscape. Um, how do you think that you can, uh, or are you looking at gathering their input into some of your advice you're giving to various groups on policy? So we've uh, recently had a meeting of all the chairs, which I mean, I mean, the chairs of the working groups uh, and me and my vice chair and administration, and we sat down and we discussed what the best way to get feedback on the various policies and work that we're all doing are. Since all the working groups tend to work separately and independently of WAVE and come back and provide uh, a report, we recommended that they reach out to their networks when they're providing, for example, feedback on the people for hire policy and have sort of grassroots conversations, whether that's socially distant, having a conversation with your mother or, or um, sort of having those, um, sorry, I live on 87th Avenue when the fast cars go by and they make a lot of noise. Um, but we recommended that they reach out to the networks before finalizing any feedback that they give out to the reports. 
Um, we are trying to establish virtual networks uh, so that we can be more in touch as we were when we were all meeting in person. Um, as you all know, it is a little bit difficult, especially considering the numbers are rising and we don't want to contribute to those numbers in any way. Um, we are in the process currently of reaching out to members and asking them to um, reach out to their uh, different committees and networks that they're part of, if they're volunteering with uh, at their school, for example, or if they're volunteering with any of their community groups that they're a part of, to talk with them, to get their assessment on what is most important, specifically looking towards pandemic recovery in Edmonton, and then reporting back to, to WAVE so that we can find the best way to move forward and help all of the communities and their needs. Well, thank you. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm happy to uh, move the report and then speak to it. I'll second that. Go ahead and speaking to it. Well, I just really want to thank the women of WAVE. I know that uh, we met um, informally in between their formal times, and uh, I asked them many questions about how women were handling the pandemic, knowing that women are greatly impacted, and their uh, insight we had administration join us was valuable in developing the plans for recovery for the city. So I want to say thank you. Uh, even though it was informal, that was really able to give input to administration. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you for uh, participating. We highlighted WAVE at the Searching for Izena event on International Women's Days. And the leadership of WAVE was highlighted and appreciated by many. So thank you very much for the work you do then and throughout the year. Thank you so much. Thank you. I second that too. <laughs> uh, I see no further um, comments or questions at this time, so we'll vote on receipt of information. Yes. And Councillor Banga as well, please. Mr. Clerk, yes. Thank you. Display the vote, please. That information is re received. <laughs> Thank you, Hersharan. Um, Next up will be Dan Rose and Amber Paquette from the Edmonton Historical Board. Welcome. Good evening. Thanks for having us. Um, I do believe I have some slides. I'm wondering if the clerk will get those fired up just to help me ramble through this evening's presentation to you. So, uh, so good evening, uh, members of council. Uh, my name is Dan Rose. I uh, currently have the privilege of serving as the chair of the Edmonton Historical Board, uh, and my colleague Amber Paquette, who is serving as Edmonton Sixth Historian Laureate, uh, is joining me as well. Uh, if you can flip to the next slide, please. Oh, we've lost it. Hold on, we'll get those slides back up for you. No sweat, no sweat. Okay, they're back. There we go, groovy. Okay, um, slide number two, please, thanks. Okay, so uh, the Empton Historical Board, uh, we are an advisory board to City Council. Uh, we provide information and recommendations relating to Edmonton's history, and specifically in reference to the city's built heritage uh, to you, our mandate is to encourage, promote, and advocate for the preservation and safeguarding of historical properties, resources, communities, and documentary heritage. Next slide, please. We are an 11 member board um, in the best of times. Um, our membership over the past two years, and I'll provide a bit of a snapshot here, um, has ebbed and flowed. Uh, so we've experienced a bit of a bit of attrition and, and certainly some, some challenges in retention and turnover over the last couple of years. Um, one of the fun side effects of having a, a board demographic that begins to skew considerably lower is that we run into lots of um, challenges in terms of, of retaining folks as their lives change and evolve. And so we've managed, I would say, on a, a bit of a skeleton crew the last couple of years, as I'm hearing from, from a number of 
uh, my colleagues in, in the ABC world here, but um, I'm, I'm happy to report that uh, as, of, uh, as of last week or this month, I guess, we will actually be back up to a full complement of, of board members. So we'll be operating at full capacity um, for I think the first time in, in quite some time. So, so I'm quite optimistic about uh, how we'll be able to get back into work and, and fully leverage a, a full board um, to really dig into the, the work we have underway at our committees. And uh, with that, I'm also happy to report that um, our recent recruitment efforts have, have been quite positive, uh, both in terms of recruiting folks uh, representing a bit more of a diverse background and also in recruiting folks with um, specific competencies and skills that we know um, have been lacking in our board membership for some time. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic about uh, the next iteration of, of board members that will be uh, working with you and working with administration. Um, we have three uh, subcommittees presently, uh, or we had up until, uh, as I'll explain shortly, um, over the course of 2019 and 2020, we had three uh, primary subcommittees, uh, including the Historic Outreach Committee, the Historic Resource Review Panel, and the Plaques and Awards Committee. And uh, the bulk of our work flows through those three committees, uh, which comes back to us as a board and invariably comes forward to you as recommendations or advice or, or correspondence on a variety of historical issues. I wonder if you could flip to the next slide, please. So we'll provide a quick highlight uh, of 2019 as it was, uh, and then we'll, we'll zip into sort of the year before us. Um, over the course of 2019, or in, in 2019, I should say, in the summer of 2019, um, the board initiated probably the most significant part of our work, I would say, in, in my term, which was to say a review of uh, our EHB mandate, our committee structure and activities. Uh, and that was undertaken uh, with, with an eye on making sure that uh, as a board, we were being responsive to the needs of council and administration, and we were um, fulfilling our mandate and, and doing the things that we know only we can do as a board uh, equipped to, to speak to the specific subject matter uh, for which we're responsible. So that work initiated with two facilitated sessions, and then over the course of 2019 and 2020, uh, we continued with, with uh, work internally as a board through a variety of strategic planning sessions that produced uh, a number of changes in the board that I'll, I'll speak to in a moment. Uh, of course, you also heard from us quite a bit. Um, so we made a number of presentations to council and certainly provided correspondence on a number of matters, uh, um, including but not limited to uh, a plan for city owned historic resources, uh, some work on the river crossing project, um, the East heritage reserve fund sustainability, some street, streetscape redesign, and as well as uh, some neighborhood renewal initiatives in Garneau and the Highlands. Um, some particularly fun aspects of our, of our 2019 year were piloting two uh, historic e-scooter tours and a fun partnership with Pass for People to uh, demonstrate how folks can use active transportation to connect with the history of their city. And of course, more uh, in line with our operational commitments to you, we, we provided eight new plaques and, and recommended three properties for the inventory of historic resources. Some additional work that kicked off in 2019 included uh, a content audit of Edmonton's architectural heritage. So this came out of uh, a recommendation uh, from a student intern we had on our board uh, that identified a number of gaps in, in that platform with respect to uh, cultural diversity and inclusion and, and really how we share the full history of our city. Uh, so that work uh, was initiated in 2019 and we've actually got a really solid project underway that we'll be wrapping up uh, this year to uh, essentially look at telling the, the, doing a better job of telling a bit more of a diverse history of the city of Edmonton and ensuring that we are including opportunities for diverse voices uh, on that digital platform. And of course, over the course of 2019, you, you've heard from us quite a bit uh, on Hangar 11, and we worked closely with administration and, and with a few folks in the community uh, to keep that, that matter at the forefront of, uh, of your minds, hopefully, and, and within uh, the heritage community as well. Next slide, please. We also continued to do a fair amount of work through our, our standing committees as well. And some of that work, of course, was growing our digital engagement um, using a variety of tools. Uh, so we successfully um, grew that audience quite a bit. Uh, we also partnered with the Faculty of Graduate Studies and Research to, to uh, have two board interns uh, participate in the board and that led to some really awesome work. Uh, primarily that report I, I just indicated on uh, opportunities to, to better share the indigenous history of Edmonton and as well an event uh, that we partnered with Nerd Night to, uh, to host um, that again was a, a great opportunity to connect citizens to the history of our city. 
We also recruited five new community members. Um, recruitment of community members has been um, pretty significant for us just with some of the challenges in, uh, in keeping and retaining board members through the usual churn. So we've really um, relied on the commitment of dedicated volunteers who, who join our, our committees as public members to support some of that work. Um, all our work happens at the committee level, so it's, it's critical that we have um, a bit of a few, a few extra hands to uh, help make sure that work uh, gets over the goal line. We also uh, awarded three historical awards in 2019, uh, and um, we were quite happy to support a successful bid um, for the National Trust Conference, uh, Joint National Trust and Association for Preservation Technologists Conference in 2020 in Edmonton, and we were incredibly excited, uh, and then 2020 happened, uh, and sadly the, the conference uh, didn't occur quite as we had planned, but um, we were quite happy to work with our partners at a national level and certainly with a number of folks in the community to uh, to put Edmonton on the map for that event. We hope to have them back at some point in the near future. Um, which brings us to 2020. So the, the previous year, of course, as you've heard from most most folks here so far, um, there's been obviously that, that difficult um, transition to the virtual side of things. I would say we managed that transition quite ably and we managed to carry on most of the work of our subcommittees and, and 2020 wasn't a terrible year to face the, the situation we had because, um, as I alluded to, the significant work in that mandate review and, and reviewing our activities and our board structure, the past year has really been one of, of sort of growing an internal reflection anyway, so it, it actually offered us a really good opportunity to do some of that housekeeping without necessarily having the same expectations of how our work would, uh, would normally occur in a non-COVID context. So, so over the course of 2020, we, we've completed that that review uh, and a bit of a restructuring that has uh, set, that's created two new board subcommittees, um, including an advisory committee that uh, is a new committee. Um, that committee will essentially provide a, a pretty significant touch point for how the board uh, actually shows up to engage with council and committee and, and how, we work, how we work with administration to advance uh, policy recommendations and, and advice on how we can preserve uh, heritage in Edmonton. And we also struck a policy and planning committee, which is a bit of a departure um, for us as well. And this, this committee is really uh, recognizing that this is a significant aspect of our work and, and a core part of our mandate to you as advisors that we probably have neglected uh, for, for quite some time. So a core part of this work will actually be um, following in the footsteps of, of the transit committee, uh, bringing forward reports and bringing forward policy recommendations and really working with council and administration uh, more proactively to make sure that heritage is plugged into the right policy conversations at the right time um, so that our board is, is not uh, always so often in that reactionary position of having to respond to something after the fact. So, so these two new committees combined, I think, will provide a, a, pretty significant, um, a pretty significant juncture for the board in terms of how we will look to fulfill our mandate to you. Uh, and how we will look to provide the best possible recommendations and policy advice to you as a, as a board. I'm also really happy to share that uh, in 2020, we joined uh, the Climate Heritage Network. Uh, that's essentially an informal network of organizations um, around the world that are, are looking at the impacts of climate change on heritage conservation and conversely how heritage conservation can be a tool to support meaningful action uh, in, around the climate change issue. So it's, uh, we're really excited to see where that, uh, that relationship can go. And it's, a, it's a, mostly a sort of learning and educational informational network, but um, we've certainly had some interesting conversations with some local organizations um, around how we might be able to partner to make sure that um, the matter of historic preservation and climate change is, is one that is top of mind as, as the city of Edmonton certainly works through a number of strategies and plans to implement a, a more uh, resilient and, and um, sustainable city. So as I alluded to over the course of 2020, um, that, that audit of our Edmonton's architecturalheritage.ca website uh, was a pretty big part of the work and we have a, a good relationship moving forward on that with some strong direction as to how we can incorporate new copy and new perspectives onto that digital platform. And I, I think that will go a long way to, uh, to making sure we have a more diverse representation of, of heritage uh, and specifically how, how other voices have contributed to our city's built heritage as well. So I'm quite optimistic to see how that work will go. 
Um, another big highlight of 2020 was, of course, the recruitment of our sixth historian laureate, um, Amber Paquette, who, who will speak to her work um, shortly. Uh, over the course of 2020, we produced 11 new historical plaques. We had two historical awards and uh, recommended three properties to the inventory of historic resources. And then, of course, I think it's probably the biggest, uh, the biggest win we've, we've had in my memory uh, would be the incredible result that we had on Hangar 11 and, and the work that went into that. That provided a, a considerable amount of, of work for the board over the last year. Uh, it, it certainly gobbled up a lot of our attention, uh, but I'm, I'm quite happy with the result that we've got there. And, and again, I would like to thank um, Council for the, for the support on that direction. I think we will truly get a really uh, incredible project there that, that uses history as a starting point as opposed to, uh, to an obstacle to be removed. Uh, next slide, please. And rounding out 2020, um, again, you, you heard from us quite a bit over the course of the year, um, perhaps not so much as in previous years, and certainly um, you'll hear from us more in the coming year, but um, some notable uh, issues that, that we had the opportunity to comment on included a proposal to uh, redevelop the historic Archibald Block on White Avenue. Uh, we had the opportunity to share our support for the work to, uh, to create uh, Indigenous ward names. Uh, and of course, we provided some comment on a number of neighborhood renewal initiatives, Hangar 11, as I mentioned, and uh, the, Black, the Minshaw Blacksmith Shop, as well as some shovel-ready heritage investment opportunities that uh, we worked on with our partners at the Heritage Council uh, and the National Trust for Canada. Uh, over the course of the year, uh, while we may not have been, been meeting in person or out about in person, we certainly had no lack of opportunities to get in front of the media to uh, elevate the matter of, of historic conservation in Edmonton, and I would say we did a good job of, of keeping that, that issue top of mind uh, to a lot of folks. Uh, and the, another huge highlight of 2020 was um, some incredible work um, at our Historic Outreach Committee to uh, plan a, an anti-racism panel event with the Center for Race and Culture. And, and that, uh, that event occurred uh, just early in, in the new year uh, of this year, and it was a, an incredible opportunity um, to share in some lessons and some learnings and, and hear from folks, um, including Senator Paula Simons, uh, Rob Hool, uh, and a number of folks who, who provided some really fascinating perspective on how how we as a city and how we as a board and, and how community organizations can deal with some of the difficult legacies that, uh, that confront our usual narratives of, of the history of our city. So great opportunities there. And, and that, that in a nutshell um, was 2020. So uh, next slide, please. So the, the big thing I, I think that will guide the, the work plan for 2021 is, is really the managing a, a board transition and, and the onboarding. So as I alluded to, we've been operating pretty short staffed for quite some time. So um, we've just successfully recruited five new board members as well, which um, will, will almost double our complement. So with that, uh, that new growth of board members, that, that will obviously require a fair bit of attention to making sure those board members can be engaged in the right ways and, and we can get them staffed onto uh, what are also new committees. So there's a lot of new at, at the EHB uh, and certainly a lot of new to be managed uh, in, in the coming months here. Uh, and as I, as I alluded to, we're also refocusing quite a bit um, our priorities and activities to really support the, the policy and advisory function that, that we have to you as, as board advisors. So as I mentioned, that policy and planning committee it will really be about making sure that uh, as a board, we're, we're using the expertise we have and the experience we have as, as folks in this space to, to develop uh, a really comprehensive platform of, of heritage policies and, and recommendations that we can bring forward to you to support your work and also to support historic conservation. Um, and this will really be about, about building the case uh, more comprehensively and, and with a lot more rigor uh, and, and I think methodology than perhaps we have done in the past and really about providing the board with the assets and the platforms and the tools to be better uh, advocates to you. So the policy and planning committee, um, a big priority for 2021, of course, will be uh, making sure that new committee is staffed up accordingly with board members and public members. Uh, and making sure that we can build a robust work plan right out of the gate so that that committee can get to work um, building that platform uh, in advance of a new council likely uh, in, in November. 
Um, obviously, another big part of the 2021 priorities will be equally staffing up um, that, that advisory committee. And this committee is, is really about how we use our voice. It's how we show up. It's, it's where and when we show up and how uh, we will bring those products that have been developed at the policy and planning committee to the table at the right time to make sure that our advice is, is meaningful and relevant in conversations. So really making sure these two committees are um, can hit the ground running and we can we can ensure some good transition between uh, previous board and, and new board. Uh, I think that'll be a pretty significant uh, part of the work for, for 2021. Uh, part of that work, obviously, within that advisory committee will be establishing a council liaison program. So this is a, it's something we've been talking about as a board for quite some time. And um, really, this initiative will really be about making sure that um, other faces other than mine and and the vice chair are, are able to um, share their expertise and perspectives and share that those policy platforms and, and the, the resources and material that we're building as a board uh, with all members of council. And it's certainly something we've heard before that there's a, a perception that, you know, only a few councillors um, care about heritage because there's only heritage in a few parts of the city. And that's certainly something we'd like to to, uh, to move beyond and certainly engage with, with council, all of council more meaningfully to make sure that, uh, that all, all of council um, can understand and, and see the investment and the value of preserving uh, our city's heritage. So, so that's a program we'll look to establish in the near future. Uh, it, it will likely take the form of uh, quarterly meetings with, with you folks and, and making sure that we're having appropriate check-ins and building constructive relationships to make sure that those platforms and communication channels are open so that as a board, we can best uh, provide advice to you at the right time. We'll also look uh, at building a partnership, oh, sorry, not quite yet. There we go, thanks. Um, we'll also look at building partnership opportunities with, uh, or, or enhancing partnership opportunities with a number of our, our partners in the heritage ecosystem. So folks, including the uh, Edmonton Heritage Council and the Edmonton District Historical Society, as, as well as others. Uh, as we look to really double down on that policy and advisory function. Uh, we'll also look to transition a number of uh, public facing board activities to other partners and other organizations, perhaps better equipped to, uh, to be doing the sort of public engagement, public facing work. So, and I'll preface a large part of that, that restructuring that we've done and, and the transitioning from, uh, from some of our previous committees to our new committees was recognition that um, we have been, I would say, perhaps uh, underperforming or underserving you in a large core, in a core part of our mandate, which is to provide that advice and that function. Uh, and we've perhaps neglected that part of our mandate for some time. So um, we'll be looking at, at transitioning a number of those sort of public facing, public engagement type events to folks probably better equipped and, and with a more appropriately um, scoped mandate to do, to do that kind of work. And, and we'll look at um, doing the things that we know that uh, that only we can do, essentially. Um, lastly, we'll we'll look at exploring um, opportunities to better recognize the, the full history and, and diversity of our city. So uh, we'll be looking uh, quite early in the new year at ways to uh, re-examine our plaques process and how we go about uh, identifying properties for plaques and how we work with communities to come up with those plaques to make sure that um, the tools we have for uh, the remaining tools that we have for public engagement are, are responsive to the full and reflective of the diversity of our city. Um, and, and lastly, of course, uh, we'll look to be doing quite a bit more engagement with council and committee and administration. And if the year is any indication so far, I, I think we've had about a half dozen touch points with administration and, and, uh, and some committees already on a number of issues. So I, I think you'll, you'll be hearing quite a bit more from us in the near future. Uh, as we work through uh, getting those those policy and planning committees and advisory committees uh, churning. Um, so I, I think that's kind of it for, for 2021. Um, the work plans aren't tremendously specific for those two new committees. Um, we've only just established them and then we haven't appointed members to them yet. So um, that'll be a pretty a pretty quick turnaround for us to get those committees churning. But we certainly will look to carry on the good work of the Historic Resource Review Panel and the Plaques Committee that will continue to do that, that sort of core work for our mandate. Um, one of the, the big projects that we'll look to accomplish again quite early in 2021 here is to complete that comprehensive heritage policy agenda. 
um, developed in, in consultation with administration, with industry, with nonprofit organizations, community organizations, and, and other heritage partners. Uh, I'm just wondering if you could flip to the next slide. And some of the things that, that I mean, we hope to capture in that sort of package of, of heritage recommendations are, are probably some of the exact things you've heard us talk about before, but um, we'd certainly like to reiterate that some of the big issues and priorities that we'll be looking to articulate more concrete policy recommendations around would be things like uh, an update to the historic resource management plan, um, how we can look at allocating resources to, uh, to identify neighborhoods that perhaps need a historic uh, survey, uh, and how we can, can ensure that we're not missing out on neighborhoods that we know um, could be at risk in the near future, and how we can ensure that, that we're doing what we can to make sure those properties make it to the inventory where eligible. We'll also look at um, working at finding ways to, to be more proactive in identifying um, city-owned, institutional, and privately-owned assets eligible for inclusion on the inventory, and, and certainly ones eligible for designation, and finding ways to work with the owners of, of those buildings to make sure that they're aware of the opportunities uh, from designating, and, and that we can sort of create a much um, a much simpler journey to designation that, that gets us to where we know we, we want to be. There's certainly a number of other uh, priorities there that we've listed. We'll certainly look at bringing forward some financial and tax tools to, to support conservation, uh, looking at ways to, to better support and resource the heritage management unit, uh, as well as making sure that, again, those conversations around how heritage can actually contribute to meaningful action on climate change. Um, can be incorporated into some of the work that's underway. Uh, and we'll certainly work, look to work with, uh, with our partners in making sure those, those conversations are well-informed. So going forward, I guess you can pop to the next slide, I suppose. Um, to, to round it out, I, I think um, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic that, um, you know, the board, I would say, has come quite a long way in, in my time. Uh, I've been a board member for six years now, and I think the board has certainly grown and evolved in, in our focus and the things that we know we can do for council. I, I'm still optimistic that we will um, we'll get to that point where, where the value of heritage is understood as that critical starting point and, and not an obstacle um, for, for the growth of our city and I think you have in this board a, a tremendously and a remarkably dedicated and passionate group of, of civic leaders who are, who are, I think, more fired up than ever to, to be champions for heritage. And I, I'm quite confident that you'll be hearing from quite a few of them um, and quite a, quite, a, quite a few more than the usual suspects that you hear from our board. So um, I, I think I'm, I'm pretty optimistic for, for the, the future board. I'd be lying if I uh, if I said this this work was easy, but um, you know our, our group has shown up time and time again um, because we we truly do believe in the power of our history to connect us to something bigger and, and to connect citizens and to provide a direction for the kind of city we know we want to be. And though our our wins may be few, um, we do celebrate them because even the small wins help us hold on to a part of our story and help us better understand who we are. So, so on a, on a slightly personal note, I'm, uh, I would like to say that it's been a pleasure to, uh, to serve council, uh, and certainly to have a small part of the work, uh, of, of preserving Edmonton's history. This is my last presentation to you as chair and as a member of the board, my, uh, my six years are up, so I will happily uh, ride off into the sunset at the end of April. But uh, it has truly been a pleasure, and I hope we've uh, I hope we've made some progress. It's it's incremental, but we've we've made some progress, and I'm I'm happy uh, with where the board is at. I'm confident in the direction of our new structure to be one that provides council with a considerable amount of uh, of well informed policy direction and, and recommendations and advice. So, so with that, I'd like to thank council for for your support um, over the last two years, and certainly over the last um, six years while I've been on the board. And of course, I would like to thank our administrative support, our, our partners at the archives and the heritage management unit, and of course, Councillor McKean, our our board representative, who uh, who joins our board meetings and and certainly uh, adds some interest to the conversation often. So, 
So thank you. And um, with that, I will turn it over to Amber to provide a bit of a, a report on the activities of the Historian Laureate. And then I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about uh, the work of the board and um, Edmonton's history uh, in general. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, yeah, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you so much for having me this evening. Uh, my name is Amber Paquette, and I am the current Historian Laureate for the City of Edmonton. Uh, just quick disclaimer, um, my sincere apologies if you hear my child in the background. I do have two children, and uh, it's their bedtime, and unfortunately, I'm trying to get rid of them as fast as possible, but not fast enough. Um, yeah, so... Um, it has just been an honor and a privilege to serve my fellow Edmontonians um, as their sixth historian laureate. I'd like to deeply thank, uh, to thank uh, the Edmonton Historical Board um, and our chair, Dan Rose, um, for all their continued support. Uh, my first term has been a profound and incredible experience sharing um, in the unique history of our city. Um, and I'm really looking forward to another year. Um, yeah, today I'd just like to share with you um, the Historian Laureate Annual Report, detailing uh, the work and engagements I've undergone since the beginning of my appointment last April. It's hard to believe a whole year has already gone by. Um, and during my term as HL, I've been writing, directing, and editing uh, a documentary series, which features the uh, timeless history of our city. Um, it's a large scale collaboration named Miskawowen, which means discovery in Crete. Um, and it works in partnership with various institutions across the city, such as the Edmonton Public Schools, Metro Continuing Education, the Bennett Center for Edmonton Park, the Prairie Institute of Archaeology, the Principal Archives of Alberta, the Confederacy of Treaty 6, the Edmonton Heritage Council, and many others. Um, in addition to my role as Ms. Gwilin's director, I've participated in various other projects, programs, and presentations across the city, uh, which are detailed in this report. Um, I also update and manage both the HL social media pages as well as the docu-series uh, website, which is uh, www.miskawowen.com. Um, so my engagements for the months, uh, pretty much May 2020 to February 2021, um, are as follows. Uh, so for the month of May last year, um, the I did some historical, uh, I did some interviews with uh, Stephanie Bailey uh, on my HL role. She's uh, on the Edmonton Historical Board. I was, um, I did an interview with Lori Alberg, who was a former volunteer uh, and interpreter at the Alberta, with Alberta Culture at the Strathcona Science Park. Um, and Strathcona Science Park is uh, an archaeological site which we are featuring in our documentary series. Uh, there's over 240 archaeological sites in Edmonton. So of course, Edmonton's history is er everywhere, regardless of where, where you may be. It is everywhere underneath our feet, and that is very much the role of Ms. Gawalan, is to uh, discover that history. Um, I did a interview with, uh, for Terra Informa podcast with Sonak Patel um, on the history of Edmonton's River Valley, um, an Edmonton Journal interview with uh, Keith Guerin on the HL role um, as well. Um, I did a virtual city hall tour and an interview with Linda Hutt and uh, grade six and a very cute grade six reporter for city hall school um, and ACBC radio inter uh, active interview with Rod Kurtz on the HL role. Um, moving into June, um, I started what was called Park Adventures, um, meeting and consultations with the Stroudson Community League. Um, and that's a series of just educational films that the uh, Stroudson Community League is spearheading um, that just details, um, you have just really fun little uh, uh, spots in our history on all of uh, history of Edmonton city parks. Um, also, ACTV News interview with David Eswap on the history of Dan Knott. Um, and a meeting and consultation with Chief Calvin Bruno of the Papas Chase First Nation regarding Edmonton's history. Um, that's still kind of ongoing consultations. At the moment, we are trying to procure... Um, a bunch of riders <laughs> and historically authentic clothing for a couple of uh, um, epic uh, scenes in our docu series. Um, and then I also did a e camp trip, um, which is uh, um, the Edmonton <clears throat> Count uh, the Edmonton Council's. Uh, sorry, <clears throat> my child is screaming in the background. <laughs> um, reading Métis history on the Edmonton landscape uh, with Matthew Hilterman and Christina Hardy. Um, and then moving on into July, 
um, we did more of the park adventures and a field trip and filming at the INU Indigenous Art Park with the Stratton Community League and CBC Our Edmonton Show. Um, we also did a CBC Gem Art Edmonton Show featuring HL students at Inyo Park um, and another e-camping trip revisiting Métis history with Matthew Hilterman and Christina Hardy again. In August, um, I did an interview with Hunter Cardinal uh, for the new TELUS World of Science. They're having a brand new uh, Indigenous Science Center regarding uh, content to include in their new space. Um, as well as a tour and interview of the Rossdale Power Plant with Big E Tours. Um, we, we filmed a large, pretty much all of the, in the inside of Ross the Rossdale Power Plant, uh, complete with drone footage. Um, and interviewed um, all of the interpreters who were working there during the summer. So that was a really unique experience. Um, we also filmed and interviewed uh, the Anthony Henday historian, Peter McArthur at the Battle River Cree crossing in 1745, which is gonna be in our documentaries. Um, completed and presented um, a report, uh, the history of Edmonton's municipal elections, um, gender and minority representation for Parerity Gay. Um, and I believe that's actually, that's up on their website um, as well. Um, I attended the Edmonton and District Historical Society as a speaker series, as an honorary guest. Um, and actually just last month, I, I did a, another presentation um, for the District Society on um, pre-contact uh, Indigenous civilizations and trade routes. Uh, I also presented a short documentary demo uh, for the Edmonton Heritage Council's annual uh, general meeting and attended the uh, AL, uh, ALHI Oral History Committee meeting as a guest of Myrna Kotash, the author. And moving into October, um, I drafted and submitted an open letter, the Trader Sculpture for Myrna Kotash and the ALHI Oral History, History Committee. Um, I performed with the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra at the Jubilee Theater in celebration of Alberta Culture Day, sponsored by Alberta's Minister of Culture, Leela Ahir. Um, interviewed for um, the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra's offstage podcast series, focusing on my role as a historian laureate. Uh, and performed again with the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra at the Winspear Center in celebration of Alberta Culture Days, sponsored by Alberta's Minister of Culture. Um, and those performances were kind of uh, slash history, slash poetry meet one kind of unique experience with music as well, it was quite fun. Um, moving into November, um, I presented for the another virtual city hall uh, school class uh, for Métis Week with Linda Hutt. Um, and we do this every, every month. We now have a, a monthly thing where I'll present uh, for city hall school um, with the very, uh, various ages of classes. And it's really, really fun. The, the kids really enjoy it. And uh, it's been one of my, my, my pleasures of uh, being HL, definitely a highlight. Um, another CBC Active Radio interview for Indigenous Veterans Day and a meeting in consultation with Evan Oxland at the Rossdale Power Plant Conservation, on, on the Rossdale um, Power Plant Conservation Plan. Um, and I participated as a speaker for the Virtual Ways of Knowing Summit um, with a new division of the Bennett Metro Centers at Edmonton Public Schools. This is an ongoing kind of partnership where um, we're kind of working together um, and engaging with students um, uh, ages or uh, grades 10 to 12 and the, they can um, basically attend the Ways of Knowing Summits in order to gain credits uh, towards their education uh, and graduation. Uh, into, and then I was also interviewed um, by Annie Wildman, a student, um, a magazine reporter for Edmonton State. And moving on into January, um, attended the Second Ways of Knowing Summit Summit as a speaker. And I had a second consultation with Evan Oxlund on the Rossdale Power Plant Conservation Plan. Um, then I also began meetings and consultations with Matthew Whitman, Lyle Tatustus, and Julia Dalman on the new Bennett Center and Kichiaskia Center. Um, 
those are under, they're coming under new management at the Bennett Center in which that's going to be a seven generations museum. Um, and they're very much interested in kind of working with the HL and Ms. Gawowen in a kind of collaboration uh, moving forward into the year. Um, did another city hall presentation, uh, Living with the Land with Linda Hutt. And then I also began meetings and consultations in January with Keisha Supernault, who is the director of the Prairie Institute of Archaeology on the upcoming docu-series um, of which, which she and her students are going to be very much a feature in those films. Uh, moving on into February, I presented for Concordia's uh, CUE Commitment Lecture Series, um, Indigenous Lunges Reimagining Indigenous History in North America. Um, in which I, I did a kind of, again, for the Edmonton District Historical Society. Um, I also uh, began my initial meetings and collaborations with Dylan Reed, um, who is now a partner on the History docu-series. Um, Dylan Reed is a former IMAX filmmaker. Um, so we are working on a lot of uh, really neat 3D content um, featuring, uh, featuring Edmonton, stuff like 3D topographical, topographical maps, um, 3D interaction, uh, recreations of historic buildings, um, 3D recreations of you know ancient Edmonton, uh, glacier melts, all that kind of stuff. And um, I was also requested to do an interview for 98.3 The Breeze for Woman of the Hour for International Women's Day, which was which was broadcasted um, on April 8th or no March 8th, sorry. And then I was requested to be a speaker for the AUMA International Women's Day virtual conference, which I was. And then uh, I did a podcast interview for the Kami Tree Room with Carol Dew. And that's about all I wrote for uh, up to February. I've been up to a lot more <laughs> since, uh, since February, of course. But uh, yes, it's been a very, very busy year, um, but a very enjoyable uh, a year and an honor for sure. Thank you. Well, thank you, Amber. It's some of that uh, content that's under preparation, the, the documentary material and the 3D material, I really look forward to seeing. That sounds really exciting. So thank you for sharing that with us. And, and Dan, what are we going to do without you after uh, six years of service and uh, uh, incredible leadership as chair holding our feet to the fire, and rightly so, on these, on these issues? Um, and I think we've made some progress. There are buildings that are up... Uh, and that have hope uh, and a future thanks to you and your colleagues that might not be there otherwise. So, so thank you. Uh, thank questions, you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, questions, uh, I see Councillor Henderson. Yeah, as much as an observation as a question, I, I was a bit, um, I'm not alarmed with you guys, but alarmed with us uh, that we have gone, you know, two years in both of your reports without uh, adding anything to the inventory and doing any work on our uh, um, on our surveys, uh, and I wasn't aware of that. So, you know, as a kind of heads up, um, I think uh, for the new board into the next budget, um, it would be really useful to have some advocacy or advice on you on, on how we rectify that, what neighborhoods we should be looking at, because I think we probably, out of a lack of knowledge, dropped the ball on that. That's my, my thought. So it's, it's not really a question. It was really more a response to the report and, um, uh, you, and and just to kind of be, be great to have some thinking about that in preparation for the next budget. If I may, Councillor Henderson, um, it's certainly something that's been of concern to us, and and I mean we see it on the committee agendas because the Historic Resource Review Panel only meets when there are things to review, and it's been it's been fairly light and. Um, we've been lucky in, in years previous where administration had allocated certain portions of the budget uh, within the heritage program to conduct those large neighborhood level surveys. And, and outside of that, owing to the limitations and challenges of, of the financial situation, we haven't had we haven't had that. So it's it really just comes down to where where we have the resources to allocate to make sure that we're being proactive. But uh, we could certainly provide you with a list of of individual properties we know, but also larger sort of districts and, and neighborhood level uh, areas where we know there are priorities that, that are at that spot where they're, they're not quite old enough to be 
historic yet, but they would be eligible for the inventory and, and they're old enough to be historically significant. And, you know, I think of, of neighborhoods that have that, that predominant sort of mid-century era uh, housing stock. I mean, but, but even things like, you know, Mill Woods is, is 70 years old. Um, that's a whole community of, of, of properties that, you know, are now technically eligible for inclusion on the inventory. And we, we haven't gotten super far in how our, our thinking might tackle that, but it's, it's certainly something that's top of mind for us because we know I, that without I, those I, surveys, it, we it would just be a really helpful flag for the next council or, okay. or we may, it may, it may go by. So thanks. That was my only uh, thought. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor McKean. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I would uh, like to move the recommendation and speak to it at the right moment. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll come back to you for that then, uh, but uh, I need a seconder for receipt of information. Happy to do that. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Okay, I've, I've just got one question. Um, so uh, a friend of mine who's active in the North Glenora Community Leagues um, has been working with some folks on the idea of uh, some interactive tours or sort of uh, augmented reality neighborhood level history. And I suggested to him that, uh, and they were as a board looking at doing that all on their own potentially. And I thought there's probably, it sounded like something we might have done before uh, and just wanted to see would the um, heritage board or the historical board be um, the right place to connect, do you think, uh, for something like that? And uh, he, North Glenora is a Noel Dant neighborhood, which has a fascinating urban history, um, like the neighborhood I grew up in in Park Allen. And, and so I was telling him a little bit about that, and he got even more interested and excited, and then he demanded to know who he could talk to to find resources to help capture that history and and not just outsource it but really empower community members to to collect those stories and share them with each other and I thought there was something there so I thought I'd bounce that off you for some guidance um, of whether you think that's something uh, either you you either of you the board or uh, the HL position uh, could assist with and what your guidance would be uh, it's a it's an excellent question, Mayor Iveson. It's certainly one that I would say in previous years uh, we would look at um, with with a lot of enthusiasm. It's it's very tempting for us. Part of the the restructuring that we've gone through and part of the realization that we've had as a board is that there are a lot of other organizations in the heritage space um, that are I would say are probably more ably um, structured and suited and, and, and resourced and with a mandate to do exactly that thing. And, and I would say it's not actually us. Um, I would, I would encourage you to, uh, to pass that individual off to, um, the Edmonton Heritage Council. I think that our, we're, we're being a bit more judicious in how we, we triage things as they come forward, knowing that we have organizations and, and partners in that heritage ecosystem that are, are much better equipped to do exactly that kind of thing. Um, than us as a board, I think we'd certainly be supportive, and we'd love to see the product. But I, I would, I would hazard a guess that uh, that would be a much more suitable question and conversation for uh, for the Empton Heritage Council to to tackle, just because they have the resources and the staffing and and the focus on exactly that subject. Whereas we, uh, as a board, have recognized that uh, it's perhaps uh, more prudent for us to to pick the swim lane of. of policy and advice and, and recommendations on policy and programming. So that would be my, my diplomatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> and Amber, you as much as we would love to, but yes. Um, yes, this is something that just came up on my radar. Um, I was asked if, if I would potentially be interested in, in um, joining on that collaboration in North Kilnora. And that's through um, just the people that I was working with through the Bennett center. Um, we, we've actually talked about this a few weeks ago about that augmented reality um, and what kind of technology and apps we would possibly need in order to make that a goal. Um, so something me personally, that I, I am very interested in, in helping and facilitating. I've already kind of given them some recommendations and, um, and what they could do. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I myself am also really uh, quite looking forward to that, that project. Um, 
and there's definitely you know many many other people in, involved uh, who can who can kind of see it get off the ground. Um, like the Edmonton Heritage Council is also a partner of the Bennett Center. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's great, and I think there could be an interesting partnership opportunity with the Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues too, and that may be one of the ways to grab up the history that isn't heritage in the um, in the built form sense just yet, but will be one day. And if we're not catching that history now, then we may miss it. So, uh, so anyway, I'm glad that's on your radar. Um, more so for Amber, Dan, I appreciate the swim lanes uh, observation. I think that's very fair. Um, so uh, those, are, those are my questions. Let me just say again, thank you to you both. And uh, I will in check now to see if there are any other uh, questions or comments before I go to Councillor McKean to close on receipt of information. Not seeing any. Go ahead, Councillor McKean. Uh, let me start by thanking Amber for all the work that she's put in. What a great choice as historian laureate. So hi, hi to you. Uh, great work. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to say that I miss um, Dan Rose's historical red baseball cap. Don't know why he didn't wear it tonight. But uh, uh, but it's uh, you've done uh, uh, incredible work, Dan. I wanted to thank you and thank the board. I've, I've learned so much in my short time as city council liaison with you and sort of a pet theory of mine that um, a community's concern about uh, an interest in built heritage probably grows as the community matures and in many ways Edmonton is still a young community but you're trailblazers and and you're you're young people and bringing that sort of uh, passion to this has been so so important and you know something like e-scooter tours for to for uh, heritage tours what a wonderful creative idea that um, that you have developed. So thank you for that. And I just, one last thing I'd say is I encourage you in some way or another to inform candidates in the upcoming uh, municipal election. And maybe inform is even the right word rather than badger them with surveys. There might be an opportunity for you to get some information to them about uh, the board and what it does and why uh, you feel it's so important. Um, and I, I will take those opportunities as I have them as well, to remind them of who you are and what you do and the good work that you continue to do. And I think Hangar 11 is just one example of that. But uh, uh, you put in, you know, you chew away on these issues and in the background and nobody knows about the work that uh, uh, groups like yours do to make this um, a much more interesting, vibrant, city so please go away tonight knowing that um this council really appreciates your work we have difficult decisions when you bring your recommendations to us but we're better off having those recommendations than not having them so uh thank you very much both of you for representing the rest of the historical board and please pass along our thanks to all of them thanks mr Miller. thank you Thank you. Thank you so much. Please vote on receipt of information. We have all the votes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, display the vote, please. Carried unanimously. I am going to propose that we take just a few moments before we carry on with our last two panels, uh, mainly because I can't really hand off the chair very elegantly because there's no one else here. So um, with your indulgence, uh, if we could take uh, five minutes and come back at 755, um, then we'll be refreshed for the home stretch here. Unless there are any objections to that. Then, with the consent of the assembly, we'll pause for about five minutes. Thanks.
All right, uh, we'll come back in 30 seconds. Stand by for roll call. All right, I think I see enough faces on the board to uh, resume. Um, Councillor, pardon me, Councillor Zadek? Yep, thanks. Welcome back, Councillor Essinger? Uh, present. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton? Good evening. Thank you, Councillor Henderson? Yep, I'm here. Excellent, Councillor Knack? Good evening, I'm here. Good day, Councillor McKean? Good evening. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Nickel? Councillor Nickel? Yeah, I'm here. Welcome Hello? back. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Councillor Paquette? Uh, good evening. If these presentations weren't so fascinating, I'd be looking with longing outside, but as it is, I don't even notice. <laughs> Actually, yeah, the light is quite beautiful right now. Councillor Walters? Present. Thank you. Councillor Banga? I am here. Thank you. Councillor Cartmel? Good evening. Good evening. And Councillor Katarina? No? Okay. Well, that's 12. That's plenty. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you to Ricky Liu and Anuj Krishnan for uh, your perseverance here uh, and your patience. Um, you now have our complete and undivided attention again, so the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, councillors, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the opportunity to present today and share with you some of the fantastic work that the City of Edmonton Youth Council has completed over the past year, as summarized in our annual report. Next slide, please. So my name is Ricky Liu, and I currently have the pleasure of serving as the chair of CEYC. Alongside me is Anuj Krishnan, our wonderful vice chair. The annual report being presented today covers our progress and work from both the previous 2019 to 2020 term, as well as the current 2020 through 2021 term. Next slide, please. So what is CEYC? Well, at its core, CEYC is the single most impactful opportunity for young Edmontonians looking to become more involved in the municipal processes of our city. By having a space for youth to volunteer, have their say, make a difference in our city, we end up with a more engaged and empowered society. CEYC is made up of a committee, of appoint a committee appointed by city council and three subcommittees managed by those members, along with our youth at large volunteer members. From advocacy to fundraisers, now webinars and school visits, our membership has a wide variety of interests, passions and skills that are well reflected in our work. And in the end, every single member helps us better serve the youth community of Edmonton. The majority of our activity is derived from our membership, where with each and every project, we tackle actual matters and impact the lives of our members. This means that the youth of Edmonton shape what CEYC is at its core. And to us, there isn't a better means of bringing youth voices to city council from the public that we've been tasked to serve. Next slide, please. CEYC's mission is to educate and empower youth to provide meaningful input and to take action on local issues and municipal politics. What this comes down to is making contact with our city's youth population by any means necessary. May it be online, in person, in their schools, or in the geographies where they feel most comfortable spending time in. Education and empowerment go hand in hand when it comes to Edmonton, Edmontonian youth. And when we uplift our young people by giving them the tools to build their own successes, they'll do things we can't even imagine. We've made certain that our work ties into the work already being undertaken by the city council and by city administration by using some of your guiding principles and roadmaps as cornerstones in our work. Take the city plan, for example. Last term, one of our subcommittees worked with the city plan team to bring urban, uh, urban planning workshops to schools as part of our school visits initiative. 
These hands-on activities provided youth with a visualization of densification, active transport, and what their future of Edmonton may look like. In addition, Anuj and Robin Taylor, both appointed members to the Youth Council, worked with the Mayor's Office to provide youth feedback on the document. This term, our Paths for People Working Group will be presenting a response to the Bike Implementation Guide on May 11th. Biking infrastructure and active transport fall under subsections 2.1 through 2.5 of the Edmonton City Plan. I'll pass it on to Anuj for the next slides. Um, next slide, please. As of the 2016 Municipal Census, there are over 117,172 youth in Edmonton between the ages of 10 and 24. This substantial component of our city's population has a lot to say. We can't even keep up sometimes. With huge aspirations and dreams for their future, who can blame them for having so much to say? The daily lives of youth in Edmonton can tell us a lot about how our city is shaping up for all Edmontonians. And their feedback can give us some incredible direction on where to go next with our policy and development decisions as a city. Their work, education, recreation, and social lives in our city are shaped by the decisions made by city council and city administration. But very rarely do they feel connected to the decisions being made on their behalf, on behalf of their futures. This comes not from apathy. If anything, youth have been more active than ever in the last year, whether it be Black Lives Matter, stomping out Islamophobia or Asian hate, but rather from a lack of knowledge and connection when it comes to these institutions. Next slide, and Ricky will be taking it back. Thank you. So let's take a look at where this term started and where our previous term started. So next slide, please. For our strategic planning sessions last year, for two Saturdays, we held two sessions with our voting committee members, as well as with our youth at large volunteers. From this meeting, we developed several priorities which guided our committee's work last year. These included good governance, diverse outreach, youth involvement, spreading knowledge, youth well-being, external collaboration, internal professional development, and responding to council policies and reports. Next slide. For a full day in December, we had a strategic planning session that was, that was used to set up the rest of this current term for CUYC. The session was held with our 20 voting committee members, as well as with our over 60 volunteer members. Most notably from this session were the development of our strategic goals, which included governance, diverse outreach, youth involvement, spreading knowledge, youth well-being, and external collaboration. We also came out with our overarching values, as shown on the slide here. Now, a major outcome of this year's strategic planning session was the development of new executive team-led initiatives, including the chair newsletter, outreach to Indigenous organizations such as Enoch Cree Nation and the City's Recover Program, partnerships with City Hall School, and the formation ships of new partnerships with the Sister Cities Program at the City of Nashville. Further information on these sessions and our priorities can be found in attachments one and two of the report before you. Next slide, please. So where are we now? Next slide. Thanks. We currently have 83 youth working with CUYC, including appointed members, youth at large members, drop-in members on our all subcommittees. This is our largest membership to date. We have 11 school visits, including several to City Hall School, planned for the current upcoming term. This is more than previous years, especially given the delayed start to the current term. Our school visits aim to educate and engage the diverse youth who may wish to apply to CUYC next year or in the future. Between April and August 2021, we currently have 11 initiative planned, 11 initiatives planned, ranging from online COVID-19 webinars to information reports and memos concerning key social issues at Edmonton. Next slide, please. Our membership demographic survey this year was collected from all members, both appointed members as well as youth at large members. This year's membership of CEYC is relatively evenly distributed across all ages, with age distribution actually favoring the younger demographic. This is very likely our youngest voting committee member demographic in the history of the Youth Council. With respect to racial and ethnic identities of our members, 83.9% of CEYC members this term identify as part of a visible minority. While we are incredibly proud of the increasing diversity of viewpoints on CEYC, we acknowledge that there are still some underrepresented demographics, particularly Indigenous youth voices, as well as those uh, as well as disabled youth voices. Next slide, please. 
Our committee is made up 20 members from the youth community of Edmonton between the ages of 13 and 23. And we all come from various stages of life, personal experiences, interests, and we definitely have some outstanding personalities who's graced us with their presence. Our incredible subcommittee chairs and vice chairs have provided us on some details about what we've been up to so far this term that we'd like to share with you all tonight. You should also note that these images were from previous terms, as unfortunately we have been unable to take new pictures during the ongoing pandemic. Next slide, please. The mission of the policy subcommittee was crafted by their membership during our early strategic planning sessions, as was done by all other subcommittees as well. They decided upon the mission of to empower, educate, and mobilize youth in the Edmonton community through the execution of policy-based initiatives that align with CUIC's 2020-21 strategic priorities. Free drive. I will add, four main strategic priorities were decided this term, and they've dictated the work that was done in all three subcommittees. These are health, environmental sustainability, social equity reconciliation, and advocacy and engagement. The policy subcommittee is currently working on a response to the Community Safety and Wellbeing Task Force report. They hope to coordinate and publish their response with the, either the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee or Black Lives Matter YEG. Our response will be from the perspective of marginalized and racialized youth. We hope to bring about institutional change. The policy subcommittee is also working on a food waste and insecurity report, highlighting the gaps within our systems and providing recommendations to solve them. They've already connected with multicultural health brokers the University of Alberta's Public Health Research Department, and scheduled a volunteering initiative with the Edmonton Food Bank, giving back to the community as they craft their report. We also have two continuing initiatives, the Vaping Information Report and the Mental Health and Addictions Information Report. The Vaping Information Report is using the data collected in previous terms to launch a social media campaign to raise awareness about vaping, and that will begin in June. The Mental Health and Addictions Information Report is preparing a survey to collect data regarding the impacts of COVID-19 and the concerns exp experienced by youth regarding mental health and addictions. Next slide, please. Our project subcommittee's mission is to empower, educate, and mobilize youth in the Edmonton community through the execution of initiatives that align with CYC's 2020-2021 strategic priorities. Project Subcommittee is currently working on two upcoming webinars in the next month and a half. The first webinar, Youth Tackling COVID-19, will be about physical and mental health and vaccine education during the pandemic. and will be on May 1st from 6 to 7.30 p.m. We currently have professors and experts from the immunology field and health field from the University of Alberta confirmed to present at the event. Our second webinar, Environmental Awareness, will be on May 29th and we'll focus on how youth can be better advocates for change in our environment, providing them with the toolboxes to help create and foster change. The Scholarships and Volunteer Opportunities Initiative is currently in the design phase, creating a webpage within the CEYC website where youth can access resources and opportunities all from one place. All three of these initiatives have sustainability in mind, as after they are completed, the webinars and websites can continue to be distributed and used as valuable resources. The final initiative the project subcommittee is undertaking is in collaboration with Paths for People and the policy subcommittee. And they will be um, presenting and responding to the bike plan implementation guide on May 11th. Next slide. Our internal affairs subcommittee's mission is to foster, the, uh, is to foster a spirit of service, maximize operational efficiency, advocate for internal change and leverage internal synergy in order to empower and support our volunteers of the past, present and future, whether in person or online. The Internal Affairs Subcommittee is primarily focused on making sure that CYC is evolving as we work by redeveloping our website for easier public access, helping develop transition documents for the next term's membership, providing important perspective into our meeting structures, and many more quality of life improvements necessary to ensure our committee can do the best job unhindered by confusion or inefficiency. One such example of this work is the introduction of the termination and replacement protocols for appointed members, which will be read three times before it goes into effect. This term internal has also taken on the responsibilities of branding and external messaging. They have conducted several school visits at this point and have currently more planned in the online format. They've also revamped our blog. As luck has it, we currently have a journalism student from the University of Alberta leading the initiative. They are also responsible for the relaunch of our social media profiles on Instagram and Twitter. 
With our social media, we hope to both showcase our work, but especially to highlight the accomplishments of youth across the city. Next slide. This year, we have addressed several administration council reports, including a memo to the community safety and well-being report. Additionally, alongside Paths for People, we intend on bringing a joint memo to city council regarding the bike plan implementation guide. In, do so, we, in doing so, we bring a youth perspective to the work currently being undertaken by city council. We are looking for, forward to opportunities to potentially speaking to many upcoming reports. We also intend on bringing reports of our own initiative to Council, as was done with the Youth Opioid Use Information Report in September 2019. We intend on presenting information reports regarding youth mental health and addictions, as well as on food insecurity and food waste. We always appreciate the opportunity to leverage our connection with Council in this way. And in the future, we hope to increase our awareness of and responses to Council reports. Next slide, please. As noted, our term is not complete until the end of August. Over the next few months, we have a lot of work to do and we can't wait. Next slide, please. Some upcoming events and initiatives that we would like to share include on April 20th, CEYC will be releasing the response to the Community Safety and Wellbeing Task Force report. On May 1st, we will be holding an online COVID-19 health webinar that pertains to physical and mental health during the pandemic. On May 11th, we will be releasing our bike, bike plan implementation guide response. Alongside Paths for People, on May 29th, we will be having an online environmental awareness webinar. And sometime in June, we will be releasing a food waste and insecurity information report to City Council. Next slide, please. We would like to encourage you to get involved with our work, and there are a million of ways to do so. First, we always appreciate members of council attending and supporting our events. We are also always open to being consulted on matters of discussion, whether from council or administration, and we've had the pleasure and the opportunity to participate in many targeted engagement sessions over the past few years. Furthermore, if you see any opportunities for CUYC to be part of collaborations with other groups, we are always looking forward to do so. And finally, our applications for next term will be opening in May, and we encourage you to retweet and share our recruitment posts to youth in your ward between the ages of 13 to 23 and help them get involved in something special. Next slide, please. So that brings us to a close. Thank you very much for your time today and for empowering CUS to bring the voices of this city's youth to the table. I also want to give special shout outs to Councillors Knack and Walters for their continued advice and support as our city council liaisons. We welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you uh, for the comprehensive presentation and all of the effort behind it. Um, questions for our youth council chair and vice chair? Councillor Knack, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks for the presentation. I just wanted to ask your your thoughts around, um, you mentioned earlier when we do the recruitment, making sure we're sharing that across all of us so that we're getting people from across the city. Um, and and when we select the, the committee, it's not always guaranteed we'll have a, a, a clear representation from across the city, but that's the, that's the beauty of having all of the other members who are part of it too. So we have so many other members that was included in that attachment. Uh, what I actually don't have, and I'm curious if you know it, is for everyone uh, else who's involved, I think that, that list of, was it 68 other names or 63, um, how is the representation from across the city? Are we, are we generally well represented in, in across the city, uh, or do we still have areas where we could use some work? I'm actually hand this off to Anuj as he's liaising closely with our demographic survey team. So when we look at our demographics report, um, what um, does become clear is that we have an over-representation over of youth from the south of Edmonton. Um, over 50% of the youth that are on Youth Council come from either the southeast and southwest, and especially the southeast. And um, the, um, we still are lacking a representation from the north side. So that is something that we have been trying to um, trying to work on, especially with our school visits and target, targeting schools, junior highs and high schools in the north side. But when you do look at that breakdown of where do our YAL members come from, it is majority of them are from the south side. 
So that is something we're continuing to work on. And with that is barriers to access, accessing youth council. And um, what we've seen and what we're really proud of actually is in the online format, this is our biggest membership to date. But when we're in person, what often happens is that the locations of our meeting, usually at City Hall or at the University of Alberta, can be inaccessible, whether it's transit or it's time for people living um, in the north side. So that is something that we are considering in the future terms, whether we can incorporate these sort of online meetings into our regular programming. But um, yes, there is an underrepresentation of youth from the north side in um, CYC. And to be clear, I don't. I'm not blaming anyone. That is, uh, the CYC has been doing as as incredible a work as possible to try to reach out as many people. I just didn't know on the YAL side where, where that was all coming from. So, good to hear. And yeah, I, I do like the idea of maybe one way in the future of getting more involvement is is to continue some type of virtual aspect to it to to help that barrier. So. Well, as uh, again, my thank you to both of you, to the entire group. Uh, it is, it is, you know, CYC continues to be one of the the best meetings to attend. It, it is impossible not to feel inspired once you have uh, finished sitting through a CYC meeting. So, thanks so much for your great work. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that, Councillor Knack. I. From many years ago when I used to have that role, uh, couldn't agree more and uh, would just ask that uh, if you can work with uh, my office to cross-reference the schedule, I'd like to attend and have that experience one more time at least So, um, and, uh, and get some input on a few things. So, um, so I'll take that offline, but that just for the benefit of uh, Ricky and Anuj. I'd love to connect with your group one more time before my clock runs out here. So uh, I see no further questions for you, though, um, on this I report. I can move that if you like, Mr. Thank Ray. you. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Second. Seconded by Councillor Walters. Uh, and thank you to you both for, for the liaison work with uh, this very important uh, group of future leaders uh, who are not future leaders. I hate that expression. Uh, present leaders. <laughs> who have a bright future of further leadership ahead of them, I think is what I'm getting at. Uh, any other questions or comments on the CEYC reports? Not seeing any, then please vote. We have all the votes, Mr. Chair. Thank you, display the vote. And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Shalini Sinha from the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee. Welcome. Oh, I think you're still muted. There we go. Hi. Uh-oh. Okay, you're coming through now. Try again. Am I not coming through? Yes. Please proceed. I'm... Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here with you tonight and to discuss the achievements in the past year and the upcoming work of the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee. As you all know, it's been our inaugural year and given global and events in Edmonton, we've hit the ground running. Um, I, I think I might just say that we are not strangers. I've been here in front of you a couple times, which has been an honor and a pleasure. And I have been pleased that we have been able to engage and communicate and have that dialogue. I think the Anti-Racism Committee. Oh, Shalini, we've oh, lost we've lost you again. I think the connection may be a bit unstable. Um, sometimes if you turn the video off, we might be able to hear your voice better try that okay are you able to hear me better now yes thank you back up uh two sentences or so okay yeah i was just saying that um we are not strangers i'm i'm but he has achieved a lot this year think, it being sorry. our inaugural year we've had the chance to communicate with you and to provide advice so I'll just say that you have the report there in front of you and maybe I'll just take any questions that you have. Oh, okay. 
Thank you. Uh, we lost you again for just a moment, but uh, oh. we got most of that. So I think we're okay to proceed with uh, uh, questions. Um, Councillor McKean, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Shalini. I hope you can hear me. Um, yes. So there was a motion that went through council about looking at our public places bylaw and provisions under bullying and seeing if that could be expanded. Um, has that reached the uh, ARAC yet? Um, no, that was the most recent motion, is it, Councillor yeah. McKean? Yes, it is. No, it hasn't reached us yet, although we're aware the motion has happened. So we're, we had our meeting tonight and we updated the members that the motion has happened and um, no discussion on that hasn't reached us yet. Um, tell me about, it, it cannot have been an easy year. And, I, and, and that's no, nothing I've really seen, but just knowing that getting a new committee going in an area this complex has to be difficult. And do you feel like you're getting, the committee's getting its legs under it now? Very much so, very much so. I feel that we have found our feet, yes. Um, our members have all, are all people with lived experience and have all been community members. We've been engaged in the community in some way um, as activists or outreach workers, frontline workers, and, and simply in our participation in our communities. And so one of the things we needed to figure out was what is this place? that is um, attached to, to the city structures and municipal government advising there. So it's this in-between place. And I do think that we have found a culture to our meetings. How do we go through difficult topics um, and, and keep our sense of mental health well? I feel that we have achieved that. We have a rhythm and a culture to our meetings now. I feel that we have found our place. The, the question that I have been steering us to for the last while has been, what can we do that no one else can do? If there's a community group out there that can do it, then it's not our place. And I think we've started to find our feet there definitely. We had our first public event on the 1st of April, and I think we shone in that role. Um, we were able to provide some skill and knowledge building for the community members and a space for community members to express themselves and and um, form, formulate their thinking and we didn't need to hold any place of having any united thinking. We were just listening and holding that space. So absolutely, it's been a challenging year, an exciting year. I feel we've achieved a lot and I do think we've found our rhythm. Yeah, I think so too. Um, you inspired me and I've downloaded a book now, I forget the author's name, an American author, and the book is on anti-racism. Mm. And, and I don't, I think that is a concept that is not, and I, I, and I can't claim to have full clarity on it yet either, but I know that's an area of specialty for you. And, and I got a, about a minute and 50 seconds left. So I wanted to ask you for your take on that. What would you what we, you know, you got an audience here tonight of, of leaders, civic leaders. What does anti-racism mean to you? Thank you for asking that. So, and for the councillors who don't know, um, aside from being a racialized person and having lived experience, this has been my area of professional and academic work, my communication work for more than the last 20 years. I've been an anti-racism um, consultant and trainer and communicator. So the, the key things that I would bring across to understand anti-racism, I would say that it is to understand that racism has been a structure um, embedded in, in our systems. And it goes back a long time, hundreds of years. So none of us here are personally responsible for it. We have all inherited it. We have all come of parents or a community who came of other parents in another community for generations we have inherited these structures. And so the first thing to understand is that it's not personal, and yet it is also very personal because every person here will realize that everyone has an emotional response to racism. We've all been hurt by it. I would say the most important thing to understand is, is the power structure of something like racism. So we're not just talking about everyone being equal and having an equal experience. We need to see how unequal 
that experience has been and then make strategic responses that are specific. One response for everybody is not going to shift that power dynamic. Specific responses will shift that power dynamic. Mm. So I hope that helps. It's structural. It's not personal. It's emotional and painful. And it, we need clear, specific responses, not one idea for everybody. Thanks, Shalini. And I see uh, my colleague, uh, Councillor Bang, is up next. And we'll probably move the recognition when it comes up. And I'd love to second it. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Shalini. Thank you. Councillor Banga. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks, Shalini, for uh, all the work you've uh, been doing uh, over the last year. And uh, I just wanted to ask you something that is in relation to um, some people think anti-racism advisory committee and community well-being task force, they are overlapping what would be your uh, answer to those folks thank you for the question it's one that we had been thinking about since last autumn when the task force was formed so i would say a couple of things one is that the mandate of the task force was very specific um, and our mandate is quite broad the mandates were quite different. So in that way, we, are, we were two completely different entities. Another thing that is quite different is the task force's uh, job is finished. We, there was no way that the anti-racism committee in our structures could have held the space that the task force did. The task force had representations from the police commission, from police officers with community members and an independent chair, and they were brought together to do that specific job and that, that would have run counter to how the mandate and the membership of the anti-racism committee are set up. So it was important, I think, and insightful to have created that independent, separate, short-term orga um, organization or, or structure to do that job. They've made their recommendations now, and it was important to have that unique body to make those recommendations. A key difference is that the Anti-Racism Committee will now be picking up the mantle to um, look at those recommendations to help with administration on follow through to really look at if, are there any gaps, are there ways to go forward and how can this be implemented. And this makes a lot more sense with the long term mandate of the Anti-Racism Committee. So in that way, I'd say that they're quite different. And the other thing I would say is that racism is such a very big issue that the idea that one small group could handle this whole thing um, it is unrealistic. And it may, I think it makes sense to have multiple groups looking at different things. Um, the Anti-Racism Committee is able to be an overview and a long-term long -term structure. I hope that helps. It definitely does. So uh, those recommendations by well-being uh, and task, uh, I mean, uh, community well-being and uh, safety task force. I think I probably messed the name up, but anyway, you know what, uh, you know what I meant? Yes. Uh, could you, could you uh, tell me about those recommendations that were made? And uh, there are some basically quick wins some are happening already. Some will be extremely difficult. Could you be able to tell me what would be some of those that are extremely difficult? Um, I, I can't say that I see it that way, that there are some extremely difficult, uh, but I've been looking at this issue, as I say, of racism and anti-racism for several decades. And I could say this is quite a persistent thing that, that holds and around it a lot of confusions. It's, it's not simple. There's a reason why it's endured for so long. So I'm not really in the habit of feeling anymore that these things are difficult or too difficult. I've been in this for, for a long time. The, here, it's, um, you know, I thought the recommendations are quite good. There's a lot of them. It's hard for me to, in this time, to respond to any individual ones. But I can say... I was really delighted in our meeting today, um, Eric discussed the report and what's happening going forward. And I know city council has made a motion 
that city administration and the police commission should look at this and create a report. And I feel um, that Eric has a very useful role to play here um, in helping support the administration to, to um, you know, to understand the depths and the details of, you know, what's what's being looked at in the recommendations. Yeah, Shalini, I got one more question here. Uh, I wanted to get it in the next 13 seconds. Uh, racism has always been here. Uh, could you be able to comment with your experience, and you've been involved in this thing for the last 20 years or more than 20 years, what is it happening more now, or is it uh, just the social media bringing it to the forefront better? Um, I think... I think what has changed now, it's it's not that it's happening more, it's that mainstream society is able to hear the communities better now. I think the combination of COVID and the lockdowns coming together with a few events culminating in the murder of George Floyd in the United States somehow broke through um, that the anti-racist movement gained global attention. These issues, ha the, these experiences have been happening. And the other thing that's happened since then with the attention that has been there, see, what usually happens is a person experiences racism or racism happens in society. They report it. No one believes them. Um, society carries on as if this doesn't go on. People feel very discouraged to talk about it. What's happened since that last summer is that people are feeling more hopeful that they could speak about it and not be dismissed or invalidated or even attacked. And so we're hearing people report more um, in, in the media than before, but we're hearing the media carry stories more than before. All these things were happening all the time. Um, but now they're now they're part of conversation. So that is what's changed is mainstream society is now waking up to this issue and hearing what people have been talking about for decades. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move the recommendation whenever that time comes. You may make that motion right now. So made. Thank second. you. Second. And seconded by Councillor McKean. Thank you. Councillor Henderson, go go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to do a quick check in with you because I'm remembering how much thought and debate um, went into how the how the committee was put together, how it was structured, how the mandate was created, um, and 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 then uh, hearing you talk about um, about you know finding finding that place, finding that structure for the work, just to check in to to see um, if there are things that, and then, and we've made adjustments as well. Um, if there are things that we should still be looking at that are, might be different in terms of tools we could give or whether or not um, you, you've got what you need at this point, at this time, uh, uh, whether or not we've got it right in terms of the way we set it up. Oh, great. Thank you for asking. I love the question, do we have what we need? Um, I think uh, I think there's two pieces to this question. One, or to my answer to it, one is that um, I, I think we're still evolving. And so I will have better answers to those questions as we go along. Um, cause we're still, we're still figuring these things out and finding our feet. Um, but the other side, if you ask me, is there something more that we need? If I could impress upon you how, how big this issue is. And then if I could, if I could reach to you to understand the intersection. So for example, the issue of black Muslim women being attacked, there's so many intersections there. Um, the mandate, it, you know, anti-racism is very, very big. And so I guess what I would just say is, and we have, we're creating a funding program with the budget that was there. So we had $300,000. Um, we have been deciding to put 250,000 into the community funding program and 50,000 to help us respond to issues as they come. There's, they'll still go into the hands of the community. I might say in light of the conversations we've been having um, this week and last about budgets, that when you think of how, how um, broad and insidious and 
persistent this issue is. It's a it's very little money. And if I would ask you if we need something more, we need more money. We we need more money to to be able to put into the hands of community organizations for projects to really make a difference on anti-racism. Great, thanks. I, I'm not surprised by that answer at all. I you know I think it's you know this is really vitally important work that is long overdue. Um, and getting, you know, making sure that we, we do it effectively, I think, is really critical. So I would hope you'll keep on pushing us on that. I mean, obviously, you know, that that's, a, that's, a, that's the second time I've done this this evening. You know, there's a chance at the next budget with the next council to address those questions. And being prepared to do those asks would be really helpful, I would think. So thank you. Um, and I, and I, you know, I trust, um, I trust that you'll continue to sort of not hold back in making sure that we give you the tools and asking for the tools you really need to do the work we've asked you to do. So thanks. Thank you. I really appreciate you saying that and raising that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Shalini? Not seeing any. Um, thank you so much uh, for the answers to today's questions and uh, the perseverance of you and your fellow committee members um, to do this work, especially virtually, as I've said with some of the other committees earlier, uh, but particularly work with this uh, degree of emotional labor, I think is is difficult at the best of times, but to keep those discussions um, effective and constructive virtually is even, is even more difficult in some ways. And so just a thank you uh, specifically to you as the chair. Um, but also through you to all of your colleagues on the committee for your assistance and, and guidance and teaching uh, as we learn here through this together uh, in our anti-racism work at the City of Edmonton. So thank you, Shalini. Thank you very much. And I, I would like to say that the committee members are so hardworking, and I will definitely extend that appreciation to them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McKean? Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I just quickly wanted to thank Shalini and the committee for their work on this hard, hard problem. Uh, I, I was I attend the meetings when I can, and there was one meeting where Shalini, with with real grace, put me in my place, and it was a good reminder of my privilege, and 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 it was a learning moment for me, and 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 yet was really important. Took courage on her part, but she did it, and. Uh, we need somebody with courage chairing that committee and with um, insight and expertise, and she really has that in spades. So I'm very comfortable about that group. I fear we have they, we have not bridged a divide in our community. There are some very hurt feelings uh, in in organizations and in the community itself. Um, I've learned a lot. I have a lot more to learn uh, about anti-racism, and it'll be my privilege to attend meetings when I can till the end of this term, but I wanted to offer my um, real deep sense of appreciation and gratitude to ARAC and Shalini's leadership. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Very kind words. Well said. I appreciate them. Well said, Councillor McKean. Please vote to receive for information item six. Mr. Mayor, point of privilege, I wanted to... Oh, you wanted to, yeah. to close? Oh, yeah, it would have yeah. been your close. I apologize. Okay, pull back the vote. Thank you for... Uh, I, I didn't see you on the board, but I should have given you that opportunity. Go ahead, Councillor Banga. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks to uh, Shalini and, and the entire ARAC committee uh, for their leadership and uh, I guess uh, work uh, that is kind of beyond their regular citizen duties and uh, it's not easy uh, basically uh, coming out and uh, and laying all that information out, especially by folks with lived experiences. 
uh, I can certainly testify to that part. Uh, it, as far as uh, racism is concerned, it's not going to go away with uh, all the slogans and statements uh, by us, all the politicians. It's going to be the solutions that are going to be coming from committees like Iraq. So again, uh, I do want to appreciate the work and uh, your work and uh, also uh, uh, appreciate that uh, uh, you can actually hold the politicians uh, feet to the fire to uh, come to real solutions rather than uh, big uh, uh, slogans. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further? I think that was the close, so I'll call the vote now. Apologies, uh, Councillor Banga. I thought it was Councillor McKean's motion, so, um, uh, but thank you for setting me straight. Councillor, Councillors, please vote. Uh, we have all the votes except for Councillor Hamilton and Councillor Walters. My, my uh, computer's glitching a bit, so I'm a yes, thank you. And Councillor Walters, please. Oh. I think he's left the meeting, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay, well, we'll declare the vote with uh, what we have and that's carried 11 nothing so I think that is uh, the conclusion of the reports that are before us uh, but I promised earlier uh, an opportunity for notices of motion and so I will extend uh, that now. Sorry, Mr. Sorry, my computer died but um, so Councillor Walters, welcome back. Um, uh, and I heard s another voice. Was there somebody else uh, wishing to make a notice of motion? Okay. No notices of motion tonight then? Going once, going twice. Then we are adjourned. Thank you all for uh, working late to hear from our community members leading our advisory boards. Okay, have a good rest of your day. See you all in the morning. Good night.